from the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. Today is Saturday, March 16, 2013. My name is John Dittmer, and I am here in Brooklyn, New York, with videographer John Bishop to interview Dr. H. Jack Geiger, a leading activist in the Mississippi Civil Rights Movement and in the healthcare field. This interview will become part of the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C. Dr. Geiger, we are delighted to be here today, and we thank you for taking the time to talk with us. I'd like to begin by asking you about your home and family, where you were born and raised, what your memories are. Well, I was born in, born in New York and raised on the Upper West Side, uh, that bastion of liberalism in New York City. Uh, my dad was uh, a doctor. Uh, my mother was a microbiologist, which was uh, way ahead of her time. Uh, for those years. I had an older sister. Uh, then I went to public schools in uh, New York City in the neighborhood. Uh, the public schools in those years had never heard of uh, enrichment or any kinds of special programs. And they kept skipping me. I think I was skipped grades uh, either four or five times, I'm not sure. And there are still some kinds of fractions that I have no idea how to do because that was one of the years that uh, they skipped. And then I went to uh, one of the magnet high schools that then existed in New York, uh, taught down at the downtown campus of City College on 23rd and uh, Lexington. Uh, it was one of those competitive admission exams to get there. Uh, so uh, all of the nerdy kids in New York who, like me, had been skipped grades or whatever, ended up at places like Townsend Harris or Stuyvesant or uh, the Bronx High School of Science. Those were the big three. And Townsend Harris was unique in making it even worse because they uh, did the four years of high school in three years for some reason. So I ended up graduating from high school when I had uh, just recently turned 14. Uh, the good part of it was that essentially this high school was taught by City College faculty and it was a wonderful educational experience. Uh, and I still remember two of the teachers who were among the best uh, explaining to us the colonial rape of Africa. Uh, they were teachers who later got McCarthy'd uh, under something called the Rap Kuder Act in New York uh, and fired from the school system. Uh, so there I was at 14 and something adrift. I had uh, a regent scholarship uh, that New York State offered on the basis of how you did on all the Regents exams. And in their wisdom, no college would let me in because I was only 14 and furthermore, I hadn't hardly grown high enough. Uh, and uh, I was in three different places, chronologically, educationally, and emotionally. Uh, and one of the things I remember about that period is hanging out at night to the acute distress of my parents, uh, hanging out on 52nd Street and listening to Billie Holiday and Lester Young and uh, other jazz artists of the period and coming home at two or three in the morning. Uh, my mother later told me that on occasion they would call up one of those bars or nightclubs and find the bartender and ask him, as near as I could tell from what she said, is Jackie there? Uh, and wanted to be reassured that I was safe. And in fact, everybody was very nice to me and they never served me anything but Coke and they kind of looked out for me. Uh, but I was uh, clearly adrift. And then one day I went to see a new play, uh, Native Son, produced by Orson Welles in the Mercury Theater. Uh, 
based on the Richard Wright novel uh, and starring uh, the burgeoning uh, great black actor of that period, Canada Lee. And I was so moved by uh, that performance and that message that with the brashness of youth, I somehow talked my way backstage uh, and went to see Canada Lee. Uh, and we must have sat there uh, in this little dressing room in the theater uh, for an hour and a half just talking. Uh, that was part of what he was like. Uh, he just made himself available. And uh, I subsequently uh, went to see him. He was living in a penthouse apartment on Sugar Hill at 155th and Edgecombe uh, in Harlem. And increasingly, uh, that became a kind of second home for me. Uh, and I spent started to spend uh, a lot of time there. I was adrift. I wasn't in school. Uh, I was waiting for some college somewhere uh, to let me in. I worked as a copy boy for the New York Times because in those years and for a while subsequently, uh, all I wanted to do was write and be a journalist. Uh, and meanwhile, things were getting my poor parents, increasingly difficult at home. Uh, my folks had gotten here uh, from Austria and Germany, respectively. My dad was 10, my mother was two or three, uh, but they had essentially European upbringings, as I look back, and they had no clear idea what to do with a rebellious adolescent uh, in the American system. Uh, going through adolescent rebellion and kicking off on uh, his own. And it got more and more conflict and argument uh, about what I was doing and uh, how I was living. And finally, uh, one night, on a Sunday night, and I can still remember, uh, I packed... Uh, a small suitcase and took the subway and went up to 155th and Edgecombe. I knew there was no performance that night, so uh, Canada Lee would probably be there, and rang his doorbell. And when I came in, said, you know, this conflict is getting worse and worse. And I thought, uh, maybe I could stay here some at a time. And he kind of looked around and said, well, there's a couch over there. You could probably sleep there. And after I was asleep, I later learned, called up my folks and said, this is where I was, and why didn't they let me stay there for a while? Because uh, he'd be perfectly willing to send, send me back, but you know, where was I gonna land the next time? Uh, and I guess they were so exhausted uh, with all of this, they said, well, kind of okay for the time being. And uh, I spent a lot of my time, I kind of shuttled back and forth ultimately uh, between uh, my own parental home and Canada's, but I spent a lot of time up there. And there were two parts of uh, the learning experience for me that transformed my life. Uh, one was to be able to sit in the corner and listen as all of these different folks came through. Uh, Paul Robeson, Langston Hughes, uh, William Saroyan uh, out of uh, the theater world, uh, other leading, uh, Adam Clayton Powell Jr., other leading political figures from the Harlem community. And it was this most wonderful education uh, then a middle-class adolescent Jewish kid from the Upper West Side would almost otherwise never have had that kind of a crack at. Uh, Harlem was ablaze. We are now talking uh, 1941, uh, thereabouts, and 
the draft was in force and black soldiers were being sent uh, south to military training camps and Harlem was ablaze with their stories of the kinds of abuse uh, they were enduring not just at the hands of southern whites but from the military police and the military establishment uh, itself. Uh, and indeed, to jump ahead in, I guess it was early 1942, there was the first so-called race riot in Harlem. It was no more uh, a race riot than uh, something totally different. Do you remember that? Were you involved? Were you I there? walked right through it, which is one of the reasons I knew that this was not a race riot. Nobody paid any attention to me, uh, and I was clearly white. Uh, this had been sparked by a rumor that spread like wildfire that the M MPs, whether in New York or the South, I think it was in New York, that the MPs had shot a black soldier. And the crowds just took off in rage, and it was highly selective. Uh, what they did uh, was uh, trash the stores, mostly on 125th Street, uh, that were white-owned stores uh, that had two characteristics. Uh, they were rude and abusive to black customers, and they wouldn't hire any black employees. And a store right next to them, which might be white-owned or black-owned that didn't behave that way, uh, was untouched. It was the first kind of spontaneous demonstration uh, that they just weren't going to take it anymore and that uh, people wanted uh, a different kind of experience in their own community and indeed felt abused not only by what was happening to soldiers but by this kind of uh, colonial economy as I think uh, they saw it. At any rate, uh, here were all of these people, Vito Marcantonio, uh, the radical leader then of the New York City Council. Kenneth Lee was a left winger, wasn't he? Well, he grew to be, yeah. is my impression yeah. in retrospect. Uh, and indeed, a little bit later on, the FBI came to him and asked him, threatened him, in effect, uh, to denounce Paul Robeson. And Lee, without a moment's hesitation, said, this is simply an attack to divide the black community, and I'm not going to do it. The FBI had specifically threatened him with blacklisting. Uh, we are into the early phases of uh, McCarthy. Uh, and uh, he was indeed blacklisted. Uh, I remember that uh, he was about to have, uh, the plans were in the works for a radio program uh, sponsored by Canada Dry, the ginger ale folks, because uh, they were intrigued with the idea of Canada Dry uh, presents Canada Lee. Uh, and that got canceled, and Ed Sullivan attacked him. Uh, on the air, and I guess Ed Sullivan had a McCarthy era column in the newspapers and uh, there as well. And uh, Canada grew steadily through this. I guess I should add, with whatever instinct uh, adolescents have, it turned out uh, that Canada Lee, whose real name was Lionel Canagata, uh, out of a Jamaican family. He too had been a childhood prodigy uh, and on the violin, as I remember being told. Uh, growing up doing that, had his own adolescent rebellion, ran away from home, became a jockey, outgrew uh, being a jockey. He got too big, came back to Harlem, uh, was winning all uh, the street fights on the street, uh, so he turned amateur and then pro, and became, uh, 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 over the next several years, a light heavyweight contender. Oh, 
And uh, then in his last tune-up fight before the title fight, uh, suffered a detached retina, and that was the end of a boxing career. Nobody in those years uh, knew what to do about a, anything to do about a detached retina. Uh, opened a restaurant, wandered around, and a couple of other things. Wandered into a branch of the Mercury Theater that Orson Welles had opened in Harlem, and he and everybody there discovered that what he was was a gifted actor. Yeah. And his first stage role, as far as I know, was as the star in a Broadway production of Native Son. Wow. He had a brother, Lovey, who was uh, worked for the post office, I think, and uh, Lovey and I used to go to see uh, the New York Giants baseball team uh, together at the Polo Grounds, which was not that far down the street from 155th on Coogan's Bluff in Harlem. And I could always find Lovey at the Polo Grounds because he had the biggest voice I've ever heard and he would be screaming at the batters and I would just wander around until I got to him. And he was my introduction to street life in Harlem, which was the other part of the education. Harlem was then essentially, uh, for all its reputation, uh, a sweet and tolerant community. Uh, and I made friends and drifted up and down the street, and it was very different from the Upper West Side and a very different experience. My folks were brave uh, in uh, their own way. Uh, Canada invited them to a party he was giving uh, at the penthouse, and they bravely made their way up uh, to the heart of Harlem, my mother and father, uh, to join this essentially uh, black party. And Canada, who was very shrewd, turned to my mother and said, uh, you know, Mrs. Geiger, I'm divorced and we got all these people here. Do you think you could spend a minute uh, helping out getting stuff organized in the kitchen? And my mother spent the next two hours or more, as I remember, in the kitchen. And when I called her the next day and said, uh, how did you like the party? She said, I had the most wonderful time. There was this man in the kitchen cooking with me and we talked and he was so comfortable and we did all the things we needed to do. And I said, well, who was it? And she said, I, you know, I never got his name. So I said, describe him. And she did. And I said, that was Langston Hughes. <laughs> and probably the one black name that my middle class white mother was familiar with. And she was devastated. She had spent an evening with Langston Hughes cooking and didn't know it. Uh, they subsequently invited Canada for dinner at our house on Central Park West. This was an era where if you were going to have a black guest, which must not have happened very often, you had to alert the doorman and the elevator guy ahead of time uh, so that they would let him in uh, without a fuss. Uh, and uh, he had dinner with us there. Uh, well, all of this was a transformative experience, both to discover uh, uh, the struggles that were daily mm -hmm. for anybody uh, black in New York and certainly in Harlem, uh, the movements, the politicians, and the leaders, uh, and uh, what they felt and what they were trying to do. And I had this window into it that I never would have had, uh, I think, in any other way. Yeah. And a window into uh, the Harlem community yeah. on the streets. Uh, Jack, what, what years was this? This was, we're talking roughly 1940, 1941. Uh, I've jumped ahead when I talked yeah. about that 1943 riot and some of the McCarthy stuff. Um, and, and a good, go ahead. But about this time, uh, you had been accepted 
by the University of Wisconsin, I believe. Right. In 1941, they let me in. And Canada Lee was helpful to you there. Well, what happened uh, was, and I think the way that worked, uh, yeah, he came out, uh, Native Son was on tour and playing in Madison, and I brought him to dinner at the, the dormitory, whatever, where we ate, uh, and uh, continued uh, the acquaintance. But what happened, yeah, Wisconsin let me in. Uh, I think I had just turned 15. Uh, it was the only place uh, that would admit me. Uh, I still hadn't grown much. It was just what I needed to go to a Big Ten campus, uh, you know, out in the Midwest where all the girls patted me on the head and told me to come back when I made Eagle Scout. Uh, and I remember the orientation uh, at the University of Wisconsin, which consisted of taking us out to the stadium and teaching us the football cheers. Uh, it wasn't a stellar uh, educational institution in those years. It's changed uh, enormously, obviously, since then. Uh, that would have been September of 1941, and in December there was Pearl Harbor. Uh, and very shortly after that, January or February, of 1942, I got a letter from Bayard Rustin, A. Philip Randolph's great organizing deputy, and he must have got my name from Canada uh, somehow, saying they were trying to organize on campus, uh, on college campuses everywhere, for uh, this much overlooked first threatened march on Washington. Uh, that A. Philip Randolph and Bayard Rustin were organizing uh, in protest against uh, discrimination in defense plans. And so while uh, being this freshman student uh, at the University of Wisconsin in the middle of the winter, I still remember freezing my butt off, uh, picketing the Raytheon plant on the outskirts of Madison, one of the defense plants that wouldn't hire, I think had a sign even that said, uh, blacks need not apply, like Irish need not apply in Boston, uh, to pick it. That threat of a black march on Washington uh, was so serious that what it extracted from Franklin Delano Roosevelt as president was an executive order barring racial discrimination in defense plan hiring. And that, in turn, triggered a new wave of the great migration of uh, southern black people to the north to these good jobs in the defense plants. So it was my first uh, civil rights organizing experience. Uh, pause for a second, Roy? And probably We're back. warned you. OK. Uh, Next thing that happened, uh, I was working for, in the middle of everything else, for the Daily Cardinal. The newspaper. Uh, the, the campus newspaper, but it was a daily, full-scale kind of newspaper. And uh, this young Asian man wandered in, Asian student wandered in, and said he couldn't find any place in Madison to live. Nobody would rent him a room or an apartment or whatever. And I started to look into it. This was my first structured big campaign of my own and discovered that, yeah, the University of Wisconsin had its own dormitories, but it also had a big network of approved off-campus housing. And it had approved for off-campus housing, uh, and that was a whole industry in Madison. Places that wouldn't take Jews, wouldn't take blacks, for heaven's sakes, wouldn't take Asians, wouldn't take any kinds of minorities, and they were uh, on the university's list. So uh, it was one of the benefits of, if you will, World War II, uh, 
that the contrast between the commitments that our participation in the war was supposed to represent about fighting for democracy and our behavior here at home uh, presented an opening. And I started uh, this long, took about six months, campaign that uh, the university uh, could refuse, had to refuse to approve any of the places that behaved this way. Either they had to change or they were off the list. And the university caved, finally. Uh, and it did make some difference. Uh, somewhere in this period, in the early 1943, uh, I met, I went to Chicago and met uh, uh, James, I'm blocking the Farmer. name, uh, Jim Farmer, the head, the founder of CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, and with some of the black students and graduate students and white students at, uh, back in Madison, we started what was one of the early, uh, earliest uh, chapters of CORE uh, to continue this kind of effort I remember with them picketing Gone with the Wind. Uh, I should add uh, at about this period, uh, because it was such a, a strange time to be so young and in college and uh, in the middle of all of the changes that were taking place in wartime. Uh, and I didn't want to take money from my folks and uh, wanted to support myself in any case. Uh, I think Canada had helped me with some of the tuition. Anyway, I started working at night uh, for the Madison Capital Times, the, uh, one of the two uh, full-scale regular newspapers in Madison. Uh, and you know they and the reason I got hired at sixteen, maybe, or I told them I was sixteen when I, yeah, I would have been by that time uh, it started me on a police beat, well, like a lot of cities during the early part of the war, Madison had uh, established a curfew that if you were under eighteen, I think. Uh, you couldn't be out on the streets after midnight or after 11 p.m. I am probably the only police reporter in the history of American journalism that had to get a special pass from the police so I could be out on the street and do my work, uh, <laughs> even though I was only 16. Uh, I had started out at Wisconsin in the journalism school and rapidly discovered that I was doing more than anything they could teach me at the journalism school, and really true. Uh, and so I dropped that and just kicked around in liberal arts. Uh, in 19, by the end of 43, and I was busy going to school, working at night, uh, continuing to do some things with uh, the campus newspaper, uh, and busy with CORE. Uh, the draft was approaching, and I uh, started the process uh, by the end of that year enlisting in the Merchant Marine. Uh, it was the only branch of anything military, quasi-military or whatever, that wasn't racially segregated. Uh, the National Maritime Union had won the fight. Uh, to desegregate the ships. Uh, and it seemed to me, uh, well, really two reasons for that decision. Number one, on principle, in terms of uh, racism. And number two, I had a pretty clear sense by this time that I really had problems with authority and I figured I would have a very difficult time in the military and one of the things about the Merchant Marine that attracted me, aside from its integration, uh, was that it seemed to me to be a much more functional kind of place where rank wasn't as important as uh, uh, the job you did. 
uh, things were structured occupationally, not rationally. It was the opposite end of uh, what was then the United States Navy, where by definition, uh, black people could only be cooks or waiters. Uh, and went to New York, end of 43, uh, or maybe the very beginning of 44, uh, and uh, went to boot camp, and then uh, to uh, Radio Radar Officers School on Gallup's Island in Boston Harbor to learn uh, Morse code and radio and uh, everything that went with it to be a ship's radio radar uh, officer and shipped out. Uh, it, the way it worked, your first trip, uh, you were just assigned and I ended up for uh, eight months or more uh, on this on a tanker named the SS Horseshoe, which is not what we called it, uh, and uh, uh, sailed the Pacific and sailed into uh, the middle of the battle at Ulithi and carrying airplane fuel, I remember, and then the Battle of Tacloban Gulf in the Philippines. Uh, came back and went down when it, I had a, a month off, something like that. Uh, went to the union hiring hall, uh, and here came uh, an opening for a radio officer on the Booker T. Washington. Uh, the only ship in the American fleet with a black captain, Hugh Mozak, who had had a master's license for years, but until the war, uh, never had a ship to command and always had had to sail as a mate, I guess. Uh, and here was this integrated crew of officers, Hugh Mulzak as uh, the captain, uh, black and white uh, mates and engineers. And I grabbed at it. Uh, it was pure luck uh, that I was in the hiring hall the day that came up uh, and shipped for the next year for three trips, three or four trips at least, uh, on the Booker T, a name that I always thought was chosen uh, without apparent irony, uh, uh, given some of the things that Booker T, Washington was, and what uh, the ship and the NMU uh, were about. Um, Can we pause for a second? Sure. <laughs> Okay, uh, so in 1946, I sailed on a couple of other ships uh, subsequent to the Booker T, but maintained some of the friendships uh, uh, with uh, shipmates from uh, the Booker T uh, for several years thereafter. Uh, came back at the end of 46. And I knew I was gonna to go to college, uh, to finish college. And while I was floating around on the water, uh, the Booker T, oh, I was about to say, the other part of that experience on the Booker T was to be in Europe uh, with uh, integrated crews, integrated uh, black and white shipmates, and to have the experience of the different kind of reception all of that had in England or Italy or France, uh, or uh, in uh, one case, uh, Odessa, the Soviet Union, uh, as compared with uh, our experiences back home. Some Clown and the War Shipping Administration, every time the Booker T came back to the United States, uh, sent us to Norfolk, Virginia, and segregated Norfolk, Virginia. And we uh, would undergo refueling and repairs, and uh, one time that I remember in dry dock for something. And so we'd be there for three weeks or a little longer. 
And here, and it was the core training, I think. Uh, once a week, uh, we would all, all the officers and some of the other crew uh, would get into our dress uniforms uh, from the U.S. Maritime Service with all of the gold braid and the hats and this and that and the other and go down to the Norfolk Railroad Station uh, and integrate uh, the white waiting room and dare them to come and arrest us, which they never did, but it was the first kind of direct nonviolent confronting uh, technique uh, that we'd used kind of in the real world as compared to the University of Wisconsin yeah. campus. Uh, and made a difference. And we, people would, uh, uh, those that you know weren't needed while the ship was undergoing repairs would take off and go back to New York or, or wherever in the north they came from and enrage the railroad ticket clerks by asking for tickets to the United States, I remember, uh, was a regular habit. Uh, and I remember taking a trip uh, we had a chief mate, a black chief mate, Jim Brown, uh, who said he just couldn't stand being in Norfolk and uh, without a car. Uh, his car and his home were up in Bridgeport. He had to be with the ship. Uh, so I took the train up to Bridgeport and drove his car back uh, to Norfolk with a couple other crew members uh, just so life would be uh, a little bit more uh, tolerable for him and uh, some of the other people in the crew. Uh, it was my own first experience of the South, uh, even though it wasn't uh, deep South, and it was a very different one than Harlem or New York. Uh, while I was floating around on the water, I had decided uh, that I was interested in biology and medicine. My dad had spent a lot of time saying, I don't care what you do when you grow up as long as you don't become a doctor. And I finally got the message that he would say, wouldn't it be nice if you became a doctor? Uh, and enrolled essentially as a pre-med at the University of Chicago because I wanted what I perceived to be a real education and I didn't think Wisconsin did that, but Chicago, University of Chicago, surely did, uh, and started taking uh, all of the science courses and the pre-med courses and the like. Uh, and I was, at the same time, active in two organizations, CORE in Chicago, which was having lots of struggles to open up Grant Park and the beaches and other aspects, restaurant life. Uh, I remember much more than had been the case in Madison uh, taking part in core efforts to integrate housing and integrate restaurants. And what we used to do was walk into a restaurant, an interracial crew, uh, and sit down. And they would tell us uh, they didn't serve blacks and they had to leave. we had to leave, uh, all of us. And we would go politely to all the other tables, people at tables in the restaurant, and explain what was happening and suggest to them that they too could refuse to be served and just sit there unless uh, the management uh, served us. So you were inviting them to join the sit-in. That's right. <laughs> uh, and that worked some of the time. Uh, and the same uh, with regard to housing. So I was active with CORE and I was active with a thing called the campus chapter of the American Veterans Committee. Talk about that, what was that? Uh, the AVC was the one veterans organization, long since defunct, but uh, active then, the one veterans organization that wasn't like uh, the American Legion or the Veterans of Foreign Wars, at least politically, uh, and was com committed to be a liberal activist integrated organization of veterans. Uh, in retrospect, I wonder how I had uh, the stamina to be doing much of that. Uh, CORE, AVC, 
uh, pre-med student because uh, in addition, since merchant seamen uh, didn't qualify for the GI Bill of Rights, uh, I had to work. And so I worked at night, first briefly for the Chicago Daily News and then for uh, the old International News Service, one of the three wire services, AP, UP, and INS, because I could work from 11 at night until 7 in the morning uh, at, at the INS Bureau uh, downtown in the Hearst Building, of all places, in uh, Chicago. Uh, the first thing that happened is a faculty member came to us in AVC, I guess. I was the civil liberties chairman of AVC on the campus. Came to us, he had a black domestic servant. She'd gotten ill, he had taken her over to the hospital, and the hospital explained to him that they didn't take black patients. University of Chicago Hospital. And we started to look into it and discovered that uh, it was the best documented campaign I think I've ever had the opportunity to run. We discovered that a lying in hospital, a maternity hospital, had a flat policy, no blacks whatsoever can have their babies here uh, uh, and be delivered. Billings, the big one, and uh, scattering all the other university hospitals, had elaborate systems for turning uh, black patients away or trying to and uh, sending them to Provident Hospital, uh, the black uh, run and black sponsored hospital, part of that black hospital network, uh, also on the south side of Chicago. Uh, admitting clerks were instructed uh, to say, oh, there's some mistake in your appointment for the outpatient clinic today, it doesn't meet today, or your name isn't on the list somehow, uh, what you'd better do is go to Provident. How we learned this, uh, the university, the student body was probably 80% veterans. A lot of them belonged to, uh, many anyway, belonged to AVC. Uh, many of them were married in those sexist years. A lot of their wives were secretaries at the university through whom we robbed their files blind. I had 60 pages of documentation provided by the secretary wives of veterans who were committed to this cause. Uh, and we then followed with depositions uh, from the admitting clerks and others. We got the records from the medical school admissions committee, uh, they hadn't admitted a minority student in 15 years or more, and before that it had just been some tokens, and impunity was so great. This was all perfectly legal in those years, 1947. Uh, impunity was so great that you would find minutes of a medical school admissions committee meeting in which people said, well, this black student is qualified, but we're not ready to have a black student at this time, written down uh, in the record. The university, of course, claiming that the only reason they didn't have any minority students was they couldn't find anybody qualified. Uh, and so we accumulated all of this documentation uh, and then went to the university and said, we need to talk with you about this interracial committee of veterans about uh, the fact that you're going to have to change this. And the university stonewalled. And we went all the way up to the level of the great, famous, allegedly liberal chancellor of the university, Robert Maynard Hutchins, uh, who said it was appalling, but there wasn't anything he could do about it. Uh, he couldn't issue a UKs. I still remember that phrase. Uh, and it was clear that, uh, as at a lot of places, uh, the university, which was a huge uh, revenue enterprise for the university, uh, wasn't uh, fully under his control. Uh, and they stalled and stalled. And I decided to, uh, among other things, attack uh, the medical school admissions 
history and record and process. And I went down to Howard Medical School in Washington, uh, which had this great uh, activist dean at the time, Montague Cobb. Uh, I later heard many stories about him from Bob Smith as a student at Howard. Uh, and I made an arrangement with Montague Cobb that uh, seven or eight of uh, the good applicants uh, to Howard Medical School that year would also apply to the University of Chicago. We would pay whatever fees were associated with it. Uh, and uh, we would get copies of, uh, we AVC would get copies of their entire application, including their grade point averages, their uh, undergraduate uh, records, their MCAT scores, their letters of reference and the like. Uh, and we went to the medical school and said, well, we've solved your problem. You're gonna have a nice group of uh, really qualified minority applicants. In those years, there wasn't any question about race because your picture was on the application. I don't think they had a box that you checked off uh, uh, that was just right there in the open. And so we said to the medical school, not only are you going to have this nice bunch, but you're obviously going to know who you are, who they are. But each one of them has been paired with a white veteran applicant to the medical school, grade point for grade point, MCAT score for MCAT score, et cetera, and you're not gonna know who they are. And we did that. We got copies of all those applications uh, voluntarily and matched them. And we said, anytime you admit a white member of that pair and not the black, you're gonna have to explain publicly how come. Uh, Had you gone public with this at all? Yes, I, I skipped over. Uh, the university kept stonewalling, and finally we decided uh, we had to go public. And on December 7th, uh, 1947, Pearl Harbor Day, to drive home the point of what the war was supposed to have been about, uh, we staged a student-faculty strike almost entirely student, maybe three brave faculty members uh, at the University of Chicago, an all-day strike on the campus uh, in protest against uh, this university policy of racial discrimination. Uh, one of the things I remember about it is Jerry Stamler, Jerome Stamler, one of the uh, uh, great hypertension researchers at Northwestern University and a good uh, uh, liberal and radical in his own right. He fought a two-year or longer war later with the House on american Activities Committee and won. Uh, uh, appeared at 8 o'clock in the morning uh, when we were just getting ready out of the blue, I had never met him before, and said, he had heard about all of this, I guess, and said, I figured you guys would need a sound truck, and he had bought a sound truck from one of the unions, uh, which proved to be invaluable. Uh, and so we had uh, this uh, big rally, and it got front page in the Chicago Sun. I still have uh, the clipping. Uh, and uh, lots of press uh, in the black press across the nation and a little bit of press in the Times and uh, other papers about this effort. And everybody, uh, I still remember all the picket signs that we had stayed up all night uh, manufacturing, painting. Uh, everybody from the Catholic Newman Club to the Young Communist League the full spectrum uh, was out on the campus taking part at this. It was still uh, part of the sentiment, I think, of the times. And still the university wouldn't budge uh, and just pretended that, yeah, they were always interested in talking with us, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, 
And I finally, I don't know what took me so long, got some brains in my head. And one of the veterans' wives was the secretary uh, to the main fundraiser for the university, the development officer. So we got the development officer's foundation visit schedule. And his next visit was going to be uh, to Carnegie, I think the Carnegie Foundation, or Carnegie Mellon, uh, in Pittsburgh, about two weeks hence. So we called them up and made an appointment for a week ahead. And an interracial crew of veterans from ABC went to Pittsburgh. And uh, uh, gave them our 60 pages of documentation and said, we are in no way trying to tell you what to do, but we do think you might want to consider giving money to an institution that behaves in this way. And a week later, the Vice President for Development went on his visit to them. And two days after that, the university called us up and said, what do you want us to do? <laughs> and it was this wonderful lesson in long ahead of Watergate in Follow the Money <laughs> and go after uh, the money, which is their vulnerability. Uh, Let's pause for a second. Yeah. Okay, we're back. Okay. Uh, the reason this is of personal consequence is that uh, this was by this time, 1948, uh, the, the strike had been. Uh, in December of uh, 1947, and I was pretty burned out, uh, working at night, going to school, doing my pre-med, doing core, doing the ABC, and this struggle, uh, and kind of half-heartedly, by this time, I wasn't sure I wanted to go to medical school. Uh, and I half-heartedly applied to four medical schools in New York. Uh, and I got a call. I didn't hear anything. It was before you expected to hear. I had taken the MCATs and all of that stuff. Uh, I got a call from Montague Cobb at Howard on the phone. And he said, you're applying to medical school and you're in big trouble. You better come see me. And I hadn't applied to Howard. I thought, how did he know? But I went down to Washington, and he showed me this letter from a vice president of the American Medical Association uh, that had crossed his desk, uh, calling, addressed to uh, all of the deans, calling attention to my extracurricular activities, as I remember the phrase, carefully written, not to be actionable, and the kiss of death. A warning every, and the AMA, not being too swift, had sent this letter to every medical school in the country, including Howard and Meharry, the two black schools. And it crossed Montague Cobb's desk, and he understood immediately what this was all about uh, and what the extracurricular, extracurricular activities had been. And he said, You're not going to get in anywhere, and offered me a place at Howard. And I thought about it for a week or two and decided, uh, number one, that I didn't want to take uh, somebody else's place at Howard, which I figured inevitably uh, uh, that would have been. I had no concerns about being the only white student or whatever. That wasn't the issue. And secondly, that I wasn't that sure that this is what I wanted to do uh, to justify that possibility. And so I thanked him and said, no, maybe later. Uh, and sat down and thought about what I would do. I was a good and competent journalist. I'd had a good education in science. Uh, and I became, and I'd started life as a journalist, I became the science editor science and medicine editor of International News Service. Uh, and first in Chicago, and then uh, moved to their real headquarters in New York. And I did that for the next four years. 
uh, I think it was. Uh, and it was a gorgeous education in science. Uh, on top of what, the academic pre-med application. Because what, I read all the major journals, I covered all the major meetings, I got to interview uh, the people who were getting Nobel Prizes and Lasker Awards for the kind of research they were undertaking. It was as great a way uh, to really learn medicine from a different vantage point as one could. And near the end of that time, 19, late 1953, I'm living in New York. Uh, I had married uh, my wife's kid brother and sister. Uh, uh, we're still living in what was their broken home with an alcoholic father and a nurse aide struggling poor mother, and they were uh, preteen and adolescent. Uh, and uh, in constant trouble at school, and I had, together with Mary, my first wife, said, uh, and we were constantly bailing them out, uh, we should informally adopt them and they should live with us because otherwise it's just going to get worse and worse. And they did, so I had these other responsibilities. And uh, we were all in New York. Uh, and the kids in school and living with us. Uh, the end, by the end of 53, uh, I got interested in medicine again. I was getting pretty bored with what I was doing uh, uh, over and over again in terms of uh, journalism covering science and medicine. I don't mean to denigrate it. It was important. Uh, I think I did it. Uh, reasonably well. I had a whole new colleague of science, set of colleagues of science reporters who were going to be prove useful years later in Mississippi. Uh, and uh, so I assigned myself to cover the annual meeting of the Association of American Medical Colleges, which in English is all of the deans on the Willie Sutton principle that if you wanted to go to medical school, the thing to do was to meet with all the deans. Uh, and uh, went to Atlantic City or wherever it was and started talking to them. Uh, and uh, a number of the deans expressed interest, but in particular, uh, uh, a guy came looking for me was uh, the dean, the one-man dean of admissions committee, uh, one-man admissions committee at Western Reserve, which was this had this pioneering new curriculum. His name was uh, uh, Jack McCoy, and uh, uh, Western Reserve had introduced this radical new integrated curriculum number one, in which clinical and basic science were all mixed together. Uh, and clinical started on the first day of medical school. Uh, and secondly, the novel organizing principle that medical students were graduate students and they ought to be treated as junior colleagues and with respect. It was the very opposite of what in those years was the classical ordinary medical school at which on the first day, uh, I think not just apocryphally, but for real, uh, the dean would get up, here are all the incoming freshmen, and his speech would be, okay, every one of you look around at the guy next to you on the right, next to you on the left, ahead of you and behind. A year from now, at least one of you will be gone. Uh, this was the very opposite. You were going to be treated like a grown-up. Uh, and I applied to Western Reserve uh, and got admitted uh, by Jack Coy. Before we take a break, I will add, uh, what, what Jack Coy did uh, was keep, he was this wonderful guy. First of all, a one-man admissions committee. It could have been a disaster in his hands. It was wonderful because he believed that medical school was a great straight jacket, and if you wanted any diversity on the far end, you better have it on the front end. Uh, 
And so every year he admitted a whole group, 10 or 12 at least, out of a class of 70, um, of what on campus were called bent arrows as compared with straight arrows, deviants of one kind or another, like me. And then he kept them for all of them for his own preceptor group, also known as Coy's Kooks. Uh, uh, there was myself. There was a, a small-time newspaper man from somewhere in Michigan, because Coy was a press buff. There was a nurse anesthetist, and we probably had six women in the class, which was remarkable for then, and at least three African Americans, uh, maybe four, uh, which was also uh, very unusual then. Uh, there was a rancher's son from North Dakota. There was a Baptist minister who had lost his faith and decided he would try medicine. There was a technician from the Atomic Energy Commission. There was a guy who had flunked out under the standard curriculum that Western Reserve used to have, and Dr. Coy thought it would be interesting to see if he did any better under the new curriculum, so he admitted him again. It was that kind of a group, uh, and I'm forgetting some of the people. Uh, and we moved to Cleveland and started medical school. Why don't we take a break yeah. there? I'll... Okay, you can have an epiphany now. All right. Uh, so we moved to Cleveland and I started uh, medical school at Western Reserve uh, and discovered the advantages as a medical student, indeed, in, at least, in uh, being older because I was going on 30 at this point, the advantage is not just of being older, but so that you didn't panic, uh, but of having been out in the real world in this whole different varieties of ways, uh, activist, merchant seaman, journalist, whatever. Uh, uh, because there were so many people, classmates, who had been to kindergarten and elementary school and high school and college and now they were in medical school and that was most of what they knew about the world. That's changed radically since then. It's hard to find a medical student that hasn't been to India, Africa or wherever for at least a year uh, as uh, things have changed. So uh, at any rate, uh, One second. A it's more. still rubbing again? Yeah, yeah, I didn't put it on quite the same. Okay. 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 Uh, you can keep going. At any rate, uh, I still had the usual wonders and uncertainties that I think many medical students have. You are so immersed in the early years, even though you have some clinical contact of uh, a variety of. Uh, patients uh, that you at least interview and make home visits and begin to understand that process uh, of what am I doing here uh, and is this really what I want to do in life? It's not what, quite what I anticipated. And I think I was struggling with the contrast between that and what my life had been up to then. Because one of the things striking about medical school and the medical school years for me is that with the exception of what happened, I'll describe in a moment what happened with regard to South Africa, uh, is that it was in such contrast with uh, my life up to then. Uh, and one day in the second year, I was standing on the steps of the medical school and beyond that, you could see the teaching hospital. And beyond that, you could see the city of Cleveland. And it occurred to me that out there in the city of Cleveland uh, and beyond this insular world of the medical school and the teaching hospital, uh, the whole question of who got sick and who didn't and what they got sick with and what happened to them then and why they got sick in the first place 
and how that was all distributed, that these were all not just biological phenomena, they were social phenomena. And my past life and uh, what I was doing now all came together. Uh, and I thought I had invented uh, what came to be known as social medicine. And I went to the library and I discovered that the Germans and the British had figured this out about 150 years ago and written some very famous books and papers and campaigns about it. Uh, but it gave me some sense. It was the beginning of my sense that medicine could be, should be an instrument of social change and that if you were really serious in addition to what you did with individual patients, uh, you had to be doing something about what are now called the social determinants of health, the social and political and economic structures that had a great deal to do with who got sick in the first place and why the poor were always sicker than the rich uh, and uh, the distribution of disease was in fact uh, a social problem, not just a medical problem. Uh, what Virchow 150 years in Germany had said earlier that medicine is simply politics writ large. Uh, and then I knew what I wanted to do, although I didn't know how to do it uh, or what that would mean exactly. Uh, and, but I was very happy uh, still being in medical school. There were some leftovers kind of for my uh, life as a uh, science and medicine reporter. Uh, namely, two people I can think of in particular that had become mentors of sort. Uh, Margaret Mead, uh, the great anthropologist, uh, and a guy named Barry Commoner, who later uh, ended up running for president, who I had covered when he won some award for his uh, virus research. Uh, uh, years earlier, got me on to, while I was a medical student, onto some committee of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the AAAS, uh, on the social responsibility of science. Uh, and one of the people on that committee was a man named Warren Weaver, who was the vice president of the Rockefeller Foundation. And so I would periodically disappear uh, from Cleveland and uh, uh, be in New York. Mostly uh, what got me to New York was something different. Uh, Western Reserve was wonderfully organized so that all day Tuesday and Wednesday morning were no classes. And the message from the faculty was, uh, go pursue your own medical interests. Don't study the syllabus, don't do the stuff we do in class. Uh, uh, this is a time you have for your own growth, uh, which was a fine idea. Uh, but uh, I mentioned we still had one of my wife's uh, kid brothers uh, with us in Cleveland. Kitty had gone back to Chicago, the other sister. Uh, and, you know, I had to pay for medical school. I had some kind of a fellowship that the head of public relations at Sloan Kettering, that I knew as a journalist, had organized for me with some foundation. Uh, but, uh, you know, we had to live. And so what I used to do on the first thing, Tuesday morning or maybe Monday night, uh, all of my science writer friends in New York would line up fat freelance assignments for me. I would fly to New York, stay at my folks' apartment uh, to save money, and spend the next day uh, or day and a half writing and then fly back to Cleveland in time for classes Wednesday afternoon. And every time I did that, my father would say, well, what are you doing here? And I would say, we have this day and a half off, and I'm using it 
uh, to earn the money that I need. And so I come to New York, and he said they never did things like that when I was in medical school. Uh, this will come up again. Uh, and, but I also did uh, some of this uh, committee stuff. And Warren Weaver uh, decided to keep trying. Had, we had talked on one of these committees during the time that I was uncertain about what am I doing in medical school, and he wanted to hire me as the science editor of the Rockefeller Foundation and spend my time going around the world writing up all of the projects, medical projects that the Rockefeller Foundation was funding around the world at some huge salary. And it was certainly tempting and I gave it some thought. And then I had that moment of epiphany on the steps of the medical school and social medicine that put it all together. Uh, and so I wrote Warren Weaver a letter saying, I'm not going to go to the Rockefeller Foundation, but uh, I certainly am grateful, and I think I should explain to you why. And I recounted this moment and that vision of the world. Unknown to me, the Rockefeller Foundation was a major funder uh, through one of their people, John Grant, a great social epidemiologist in his own right that was on the Rockefeller Foundation staff, who could lay claim, in a way, to being the great-grandfather of community health centers, because he had tried to fund one at the University of Peking, as it was then called, a rural health center uh, that had failed because nobody in Peking wanted to go out into the boondocks. But he tried. And he was funding Sidney and Emily Clark and their colleagues in, of all places, apartheid South Africa. They were the people who were in, had been in the process there since 1942 or three or so of inventing the Contemporary Community Health Center and what is called community-oriented primary care, the idea that medicine has a responsibility not just for the individual patient, but for the health of the whole community from which they come. And Warren Weaver got my letter and said, well, you better know about this, and sent me a bunch of reprints uh, about what the Karks were doing in South Africa. Uh, and I knew instantly that if social medicine was real, because the, after Virchow and John Simon in uh, London uh, and some of the other great figures of the 19th century, the American literature, such as it was, that touched on this was all touchy-feely. Uh, talking about the whole man and the whole person and this and that. And social medicine, uh, it seemed, wasn't anything specific that you did. It was just an attitude you had. Uh, and here was this place that seemed to me to be really doing it. And so I went to uh, my faculty mentors uh, at Western Reserve and said, I want to scramble all of the elective and vacation and whatever time in the fourth year uh, that I can uh, to see if I can go to South Africa and do this. And to their great credit, they said, well, wouldn't that be interesting, even if deviant? Uh, and I did all my clinical clerkships, and we got to the fourth year. And this was my first exercise in grantsmanship. I realized that uh, I had to get three places to say yes. Western Reserve had to say yes, I could go. Sidney Clark and the University of Natal Medical School, which was uh, the one medical school for non-whites in South Africa that then existed in Durban, which was where the Clarks were affiliated, uh, had to say, yes, I could come. And the Rockefeller Foundation or somebody uh, had to say, yes, they would pay for it. Uh, and uh, so I wrote, thank God, this was before there were faxes. Uh, 
or the internet or rapid intercontinental communication of any kind. It was all snail mail by and large. And so I wrote to each of them, I mean the main ones here being South Africa and the Rockefeller Foundation, um, and strongly implied that the other two had already said yes. <laughs> so they all wrote me back and said, well, in that case, okay. And I was funded and got to go. At this point, there were more than 30 community health centers in South Africa. Uh, there had been a window of opportunity. This was before 1960 and the election of Fervort and full-scale ideological apartheid, although South Africa before that uh, was uh, as segregated and apartheid run as uh, it was to be, by and large, later on. Uh, there had been a window of opportunity. They had even seriously flirted in the country for a while with the idea of establishing a national health service. Uh, Sydney and Emily were medical students uh, at the University of Witwatersrand, the medical school in Johannesburg, uh, and had uh, taken over with other medical students, uh, what is arguably the very first community health center in Alexandra Township, this peculiar uh, black township just outside Joburg uh, that was one of the few places in South Africa then where by some quirk in the law, uh, Africans could own land. And it was hugely overcrowded and congested and a slum in housing stock terms. Uh, there had been a clinic run by some Canadian nurses. They left, the medical students took it over uh, and started uh, what really became uh, a community health center for that uh, population in the thousands. Uh, and Sydney then still as a, as a resident uh, was tapped to undertake the first systematic study of what was then called Bantu health of children, African children in South Africa, which the medical schools and the government by and large traditionally had played no attention to, even though they produced most of the country's wealth, and documented this uh, appalling morbidity and mortality rate. Uh, and so when this window of opportunity opened, they tapped Sydney and Emily and like-minded colleagues, and Sydney started their first flagship health center, a rural health center in a place called Palela in uh, 500 square miles in, in Natal province, uh, halfway between Durban and Peter Maritzburg very rural, on some of the poorest, uh, most miserable quality land in, uh, in South Africa. And one of their other health centers was uh, in a public housing project, a Zulu public housing project in uh, Durban, on the edge of Durban. Uh, and in uh, my senior year in 1958, I went to South Africa uh, for four and a half months and worked first with, uh, uh, at Palela uh, and then later at the public housing, Zulu public housing project near Durban uh, called, a community called uh, Lamontville, uh, which was really two communities, the big Zulu housing project and a squatter community of Indians, that is people f descended from India that had been imported to Natal to work in the sugarcane fields uh, half a century before, and there was a big Indian community in Natal uh, as well. Uh, and had a tutorial uh, with Sidney Clark and started to meet some of the people from the African National Congress and the Indian National Congress, I remember, but mostly uh, 
uh, had this transforming experience of uh, what it was like uh, to work in a place that indeed uh, took care of thousands of individual patients, uh, but also assumed total responsibility for the uh, entire community and the community's health, housing, food, water, uh, communicable disease, uh, all of the problems of the different age groups. One needs to understand, I mentioned the papers by Virchow and John Simon. There is a paper that belongs in that category that uh, Sidney Clark published uh, in those years called uh, The Social Pathology of Syphilis. Uh, Palela, the Zulu community in Palela, this rural community, uh, scraping by on attempts at subsistence farming and cattle raising uh, on this lousy land. Uh, it was riddled with malnutrition, syphilis, tuberculosis, uh, other dis and diarrheal disease. Uh, and the reason for the syphilis, as Sidney explained in this paper, was the political economy of South Africa in which all of the working age men from this community and communities all over the country like it were recruited on 11 month contracts every year to leave and work in the mines and the factories in the cities and under apartheid could not bring their families, lived in all male hospitals and inevitably supported this flourishing sex industry prostitutes uh, outside of the other miseries in their life, and then for a month a year came back to Palala and their families and spread their diseases. Uh, and one of the great accomplishments at Palala in particular was that in the space of about three years, they totally turned all of this around. And I had this glorious time there and then at Lamontville learning all of this, uh, going around in the field in addition with their community health workers, another invention uh, of the Karks in which you took indigenous people from the community and trained them uh, and they became your outreach workers and case finders and follow up people and surveyors. Uh, and a whole set of relevant tasks, your eyes and ears and, and operatives. Uh, and at least a couple of days a week, I would go out uh, with the community health center I was assigned to work with and, uh, and tour and visit one community or village or another. They had also started a community vegetable garden uh, they were distributing skim milk for which the South African government accused them of communism, and this will come up again in Mississippi. Uh, <coughs> and I came back uh, from that experience uh, knowing what it was that I wanted to do, which I thought was called international health, uh, and come back to Africa or Southeast Asia or Latin America and do this same thing. Beyond that, and Margaret Mead and Warren Weaver and the other uh, great folks who were uh, mentors and helpers, uh, of necessity, uh, the medical school years were ones of relative political inactivity, uh, and certainly then the residency years. I did my residency in medicine on the Harvard service at uh, Harvard Medical Service at Boston City Hospital because I wanted a great teaching hospital that took care of poor people. Uh, and as many medical students did uh, split it to take what for most kids, kids or most residents, uh, doctors in training, uh, was a year or at the most two off uh, to go to the NIH or somebody's lab uh, and uh, do clinical science. I took uh, 
a little more than two years off. I was offered a fellowship in uh, an NIH program at Harvard University, not the medical school, called uh, the Social Sciences and Medicine, which couldn't have suited my purposes better given what I was interested in. And I spent uh, the next couple of years uh, uh, interrupting the residency uh, to study social sciences in medicine uh, at Harvard. Although I was, a, I had some appointment at Boston City, and a couple of day, a couple of afternoons a week, I continued to see patients, and then I came back uh, after that for my final year of residency. Uh, the one political activity that I remember of that time, uh, we're now. Uh, into 1963 uh, was organizing in Boston for the March on Washington that finally happened. Uh, that reminds me that I've omitted the second March on Washington, uh, which was uh, early in the Korean War, uh, when Corps uh, and many other organizations uh, organized to pr protest uh, uh, ritual segregation in the armed forces uh, and threatened a march on Washington. I can't remember if A. Philip Randolph was again involved, but it was a larger movement than that. Uh, and the pressure of that threat was such that Harry Truman, like FDR before him with defense plans, Harry Truman issued the executive order integrating the armed forces. Uh, and then in 1943, uh, uh, the real physical march on Washington, and I helped. Uh, 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 1963, I'm sorry. And then uh, uh, indeed went to the march. Uh, I came back and finished uh, my residency. We're now in 19. 64, uh, and took an appointment uh, as a junior faculty member at the Harvard School of Public Health, uh, and almost immediately uh, took a leave of absence. I think I was supposed to start on August 1st, and I signed the papers not only on August 1st and on the same day, I think, took a leave of absence because uh, that June and July had been the organization of the Medical Committee for Human Rights. Well, let's talk about that. What we have now is uh, the civil rights movement and high tide uh, activists of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and others in Mississippi have decided to have a summer project where they would invite hundreds of young people down to work in community centers to help with voter registration to focus the attention of the nation and the world on the conditions that were existing for African Americans in Mississippi. So there was a physician named Walter Lear who was, had been active before, mm -hmm. and he and you and some others started this organization, the Medical Committee for Human Rights, and you can take it from there. Uh, I was uh, called up by a physician who must have been part of that beginning process in New York, uh, Charles Hudson, uh, and he called me and told me about it. He said, did I want to join in forming it? I said yes. Uh, and. Uh, they arranged, they were looking for field coordinators and asked if I would come and be the field coordinator for August uh, in Jackson. Uh, my misgiving, I remember, I thought this was a good idea. There was all this activity had already started. I mean, Cheney, Goodman, and Schwerner had already happened. Uh, and there was this irony uh, inevitably associated with it that uh, this was going to be effective because white lives were valuable. 
Uh, and all of these white kids were coming down from the north, and the country up until then hadn't cared very much uh, if black kids were killed, or black adults for that matter, or black anything. Uh, but uh, the disappearance and then discovered murder of uh, James Cheney and Andy Goodman and Mickey Schwerner uh, had really registered in the national consciousness, I think, and I always wondered if this impulse for Freedom Summer had grown in part from that. I think it was stimulated by it, but it had probably started separately. And there was this, uh, I think, spontaneous realization by activists uh, and civil rights-oriented physicians around the country uh, that number one, we needed to join in this, and number two, uh, uh, one way or another, these people were going to need medical care, or at the least what we came to call medical presence, uh, the reassurance that came with knowing there were physicians around who would take care of you if need be, uh, as compared uh, to white physicians in Mississippi, uh, in the main, there were exceptions, uh, and the relative handful of black physicians uh, in Mississippi. Uh, and so, with considerable trepidation, uh, I uh, flew down in early August uh, to Jackson I can't remember who had preceded me in July. Uh, everything was in full-scale operation. Uh, the office was at 12 and a half North Fire Street in Jackson, and there was this steady uh, rotating crew of physicians, uh, social workers, psychologists, uh, nurses, uh, coming down from the north uh, to fan out across Mississippi uh, for the Freedom Summer operation. The Freedom Schools, the voter registration, the coordination with the three civil rights organizations that were involved, SNCC, CORE, and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, uh, all under the umbrella of something called uh, COFO, the Council of Federated Organizations, or Committee of Federated Organizations. Local, local NACP. Right, right and local NAACP, because uh, I remember that summer meeting Aaron Henry uh, for the first time. Uh, and being responsible for, uh, in MCHR, uh, for uh, kind of... Uh, uh, organizing and keeping track of um, uh, who came, their orientation, uh, where they would go and what they would do. It was a very unstructured uh, operation because these people were very broadly of two kinds. Uh, there were the people who came uh, with absolutely clear commitments uh, over uh, what they wanted to do. And one of the great virtues was all of these medical health professional eyes in the broader sense uh, were able to document and send back home, in effect, uh, reports of how brutal the conditions were medically, environmentally, uh, socially and economically and politically, uh, simply by being there and uh, looking around. In many ways, to me, it was reminiscent of much of what I had seen in South Africa, uh, not only politically, but in terms of uh, the circumstances under which people of color were living in both places. Uh, uh, that was uh, the major group of people who came there to find a way, one way or the other, uh, to do this work. 
And then there was a smaller segment uh, who came probably with the same commitments and the same impulses, but who were really there, uh, I don't know how to describe it, for show. Uh, what I have in mind, we were all, as a matter of course, uh, living with families in the black community. Uh, but there were the intermittently people who came down and from New York or Buffalo or wherever they came from, Massachusetts, um, and said, I don't want to do that, and rented wealthy doctors or dentists or whatever and rented motel rooms. And I remember uh, there was this guy, and he refused and was going to rent a motel room. And a whole bunch of us that were living uh, under uh, constrained circumstances and a burden on black families in the Jackson community uh, didn't have a whole lot of resources. And we said, well, that's great. This guy has this fancy motel room for, with a shower, and we are all going to come and take showers there. It was hot and sweaty, and we didn't have that opportunity. And I walked in there for the shower, and this guy was on the phone. Uh, with his wife back home, sounding very irritated and saying to his wife, how can you be sleeping when I'm down here freedom fighting? <laughs> uh, well, that was a minor commitment, but there were some of those uh, people too. And for me, it was a long look around, although at that point I didn't get out of Jackson that many times, but enough. Uh, in Hines County uh, and some of the adjoining rural areas uh, uh, to realize almost immediately that I didn't have to go to Africa, Latin America, or South America. We had it all here. It was different than when I had been, say, in Norfolk or uh, in Galveston, Texas, when I was a merchant seaman and my ship came there. Uh, uh, because this was an on-the-ground, continuous kind of experience in and within the black community. If anything, a contrast of sorts with my earlier experience in Harlem. Uh, and that, and there were, there were all of these different people, Tom Levin, June Finer, uh, other names that I remember from that period. I don't think I met Joe Disparty or Phyllis Cunningham then. That came a little later. These were nurses. Who nurses, were yes, uh, who were uh, part of uh, the Medical Committee for Human Rights. And uh, at the end of that time, that August, oh, uh, I had recruited, because part of the task before you went was uh, uh, to help in the task of finding people, although it was a steady flow. I had recruited Count Gibson. That's important to what subsequently happened. Count Gibson was chairman of the Department of Preventive Medicine at Tufts Medical School in Boston, uh, a native of Georgia. Uh, and a remarkably solid and committed person uh, racially, now up in Boston. Uh, I later was to learn, to jump ahead, from Susan Reverby, the great historian of Tuskegee and the Tuskegee study, who in the course of her more recent research had come across what she believes is the first letter of protest from a white physician uh, uh, anywhere uh, against the Tuskegee study written by Count Gibson when he was a junior faculty member at the University of Virginia. Just briefly say what the Tuskegee uh, the was. The Tuskegee study, uh, now infamous, uh, was a... Uh, a major study, mostly in Alabama, uh, uh, operating nominally out of the Tuskegee Institute and Hospital and its black doctors, but mostly as uh, 
a major undertaking of the United States Public Health Service uh, to study uh, what was described as the natural history of syphilis in a black population and marred by uh, every uh, ethical and racist error uh, that one could imagine in which uh, uh, black sharecroppers in Alabama, a whole population of black sharecroppers in Alabama uh, were indeed diagnosed with syphilis and even after early on the availability of penicillin uh, uh, denied, first of all, informed consent or any knowledge of what was going on or any effective participation in what was happening, denied uh, treatment with antibiotics which could have cured uh, their syphilis because we already knew that penicillin did on the grounds that uh, if you wanted to study the natural history uh, and the underlying premise uh, was that the natural history of syphilis was different in black populations than in white. And in point of fact, the natural history of syphilis had already been thoroughly uh, studied and published in Scandinavia and elsewhere. Um, and so the very scientific premise of the study uh, was flawed and racist. And, and this wasn't a secret study. They were publishing in journals. They were publishing and in journals. Count Gibson was one and of Count Gibson was one of the earliest people that wrote a letter saying this is wrong mm -hmm. on multiple counts. I didn't know that at the time. Count never mentioned it. This Susan Reverby, the historian, discovered it uh, decades later. Anyway, I recruited Count. Uh, uh, to be uh, one of the people while uh, I was there. Uh, and uh, uh, Count was extraordinarily useful because from day one, uh, his southern accent got deeper. It came back and got intensified. Uh, part of what went on in Mississippi during those years, worth noting, was a thing called the Kofo Creep. Uh, Mississippi had a law that you had to stop, uh, you're driving, you had to stop at any set of railroad tracks before proceeding. Uh, and nobody from Mississippi paid any attention to that because there were railroad spurs all over the place and you just went over them. But if you were part of the movement, black and certainly black activists, SNCC or COFO or SCLC or MCHR or whatever, um, and you didn't stop, uh, the cops would, uh, if there were cops around, uh, they would arrest you for violating that law. Well, the difficulty with it is if you really stopped, you were giving away to everybody in the world that you weren't from Mississippi, you were one of these foreign agitators and setting yourself up uh, for trouble. So what started to happen was you wouldn't really stop, but you would kind of slow down a whole lot and then just tremble across the tracks and then pick up and go. Got to be known as the Kofo Creep. Whenever cops stopped us, uh, if a bunch of us were in a car, we would shove Count's head out the window and in this deep southern accent he would ask them uh, what the problem was. And that was helpful. Uh, and Count was good at it. And out of his own memories, I'm sure, of Georgia, uh, this brought uh, a lot of impulses back to him. The summer ended. I came back to Boston. Uh, to start uh, my job at Harvard. A, a national uh, ongoing medical committee for human rights was being organized with headquarters in New York. Uh, and uh, Al, I'm blocking, Al Moldovan, uh, Esther, uh, a variety of other people as uh, uh, staff, senior staff and organizers. Uh, and I uh, took some part in that 
and emerged, I don't remember how, as something called, I think, the National Field Coordinator, uh, some such title, uh, for ongoing and continuing involvement. And there were MCHR chapters in a lot of cities, including Boston. Uh, and uh, Count and I, uh, among other people, uh, that had been involved in Freedom Summer, uh, kept coming back to Mississippi. Weekends, uh, uh, various local Mississippi meetings or organizations, whether SNCC or CORE, uh, and in particular, uh, the staff of the Delta Ministry of the National Council of Churches, Warren McKenna, and I uh, don't remember uh, many of the other names. Which had an office in Mississippi. Which had an office in... Financial resources. Right. Uh, and, uh, uh, and was active. And this was a period, as I remember it, in the fall when there was a kind of malaise. Uh, it's, not that all, it's not that activity had stopped, uh, but there was a kind of, well, what do we do now? after Freedom Summer, uh, and this was six months before, uh, uh, no, not that many months, a few months before we had Selma and uh, uh, the Voting Rights Act and all of that uh, uh, governmental change. Uh, and. Uh, and uh, most of the Freedom Summer folks had gone home. Uh, some stayed on. Uh, and then in December, uh, the Delta Ministry organized a meeting in Greenville of a lot of the leftover people from Freedom Summer, indigenous, and uh, folks like Count and myself from outside. I don't fully remember the time sequence, uh, but somewhere in that period, Count and I started organizing a little two-bit but real clinic, free clinic, in Milestone. Uh, near Chula in Holmes County uh, at what was an old plantation that for some reason uh, had some history as uh, a liberal focus. With, under the sponsorship of the Medical Committee for Human Rights, with money uh, from uh, wealthy supporters uh, in Bethesda, uh, the Wilsons, Luke and Ruth Wilson, uh, who funded it in the name of one of their doctors or dentists, uh, Dr. Winnick, and this was called the Winnick Clinic, I remember, uh, staffed by nurses, uh, including Joe Disparty and Phyllis Cunningham, uh, just doing free medical care. <coughs> with some support from Bob Smith uh, and black physician, in a black physician in Jackson, who had been the linchpin of MCHR's work during Freedom Summer uh, because he was a licensed black physician in Mississippi, licensed is the key word, uh, where the rest of us were not, uh, and was fearless and uh, brave and confrontational, and was constantly being hassled by the police uh, and uh, uh, confronting them. He wasn't the only one, certainly Andy Anderson and others were involved, but he was the chief one. Bob came out to Milestone. Uh, the other person who was there a lot was a black physician from Los Angeles, 
that had come to me, I think in Jackson, uh, that I recruited named Al, Alvin Poussin, a psychiatrist uh, by training, and he spent uh, a good bit of time. He became first kind of the permanent MCHR representative in Jackson, uh, but also working at Milestone. That was all beginning to happen. And then in December, uh, the Delta Ministry in, organized this meeting at its facility in Greenville, Mississippi, uh, to deal with this issue of what do we do now? And uh, the medical people I remember included Count and myself and Desmond Callan. Uh, and I'm sure several others physicians uh, from the movement and uh, probably some of the nurses, uh, as well as uh, a variety of uh, uh, Mississippi uh, civil rights folk. And somewhere in the second day, uh, and we were floundering, uh, Somewhere in the second day, I remember having a headache, uh, and then the headache went, a day it went away because uh, I unblocked for the first time in this whole sequence. I remembered Palela and the community health centers in South Africa and kind of blurted out what really needs to happen is that a good northern medical school should come down here and start a comprehensive community health center. And everybody said, kind of, what is that? And I described it, uh, this concept of uh, care for the individual and care for community, the integration of uh, clinical medicine and public health, and the attention, indeed, to the environment, but also to the social and political and economic environment. Um, and then other people, Descal and I remember in particular, started to chip in uh, with other ideas. And the root in this uh, that was of particular importance was the idea of community involvement and community participation and words like community control being brooded about for the first time in these kinds of discussions. And everybody kind of said, I think Bob Smith was there, yes. Uh, I don't know if Aaron was in Jackson yet or if he was there. I do remember Bob, uh, Robert Smith, a doctor. And then everybody kind of ran, uh, talked around a room and said, and chipped in ideas and, and said, well, you got to do that or we got to do that. But it was, an, I don't want to say not just a pipe dream. Uh, it, it, it had a quality of abstraction. Yeah, this is something that ought to happen, but that didn't mean there were any concrete steps that got formulated at that meeting at any rate to make it happen. And Count and I left and we're flying back to Boston, and we got grounded by fog in Atlanta and rented a hotel room, and Count said to me, let's talk about the deal. I said, what deal? He said, "If we don't have any money at Tufts. If you can find the money, Tufts will sponsor it. Uh, and all of a sudden, with that, uh, it became something of a project. And so, I sat down and kind of formulated an outline in my head of how to describe this. And what carried over when we got to OEO uh, was that specific question of uh, community participation and community involvement. Now, by OEO, you mean the, of the Office of Economic Opportunity, yeah, which the was the War on Poverty. Poverty, where the funds were. Right, uh, where there was this new government agency uh, that, among other things, was not going to be a stodgy bureaucracy, was going to be staffed with relative uh, 
professional uh, government and from outside government activists uh, under Lyndon Johnson's uh, sponsorship and passed by the Congress. Uh, and with the ongoing debate about the principle of maximum feasible participation of the poor and the idea that you did this with people, not for people, um, and that uh, the people and the communities uh, would have uh, a real voice. That was the talk, at any rate. Uh, and once I had a kind of proposal in my head, I went to the only uh, relevant source that I knew in uh, the administration, which was Dr. William Kissick, who was then heading the big Appalachian initiative of the administration, and told him about this and said, this is what ought to be funded, and this is what a community health center is, and this is uh, what the community dimensions of it are. And he called up uh, Elizabeth Shore, who had been uh, working with uh, the AFL-CIO in Washington and was just about to join OEO. I don't think she had officially joined yet. And the story that Liz Shore later reported that Bill Kissick called her up and said, there's a wild man in my office named Jack Iger, and he's got this crazy idea, he better come and talk to you folks. And Liz Shore, we must have talked on the phone, she arranged an appointment for me in January of 65 uh, with Sandy Kravitz. Sandy Kravitz was the head of the research and demonstration unit uh, at uh, OEO, which had this brand new set of offices on L Street or M Street somewhere in Washington. And I went to see him uh, with this yellow pad. And I think I must have talked to him uh, for two and a half hours, uh, like now, uh, uh, laying out what a community health center was, what the models were from South Africa, what it would do, uh, and with why it belonged as part of what OEO already had defined as its community action program. And there were community action program branches starting to be formed uh, wherever OEO was working around the country. But there was never a health component. No, but OEO had no health component. And uh, the, the background, although I don't remember Kravitz saying this, was that in the beginning, uh, Shriver's belief, uh, Julie Richmond's belief, Shriver, Sergeant Shriver, Kennedy's brother-in-law, the head of uh, the War on Poverty, OEO, and uh, Julie Richmond, Julius Richmond, pediatrician professor from uh, Chicago, uh, Harvard then, uh, uh, who was heading Head Start, one of the major uh, war on poverty uh, initiatives. Uh, their belief in the beginning was that HEW, uh, health education and welfare, was responsible for uh, doing things about the health of poor people and uh, taking care of it. And although I didn't know it at the time, the background of information was that coming to OEO, Head Start, uh, OEO was just in the process through what was happening in Head Start and the Job Corps very early was how devastating the level of illness and unattended illness and care was for black children and for black adolescents at the very least in the Job Corps. Uh, there were huge rates in the 65% level of uh, serious, not minor, unattended health problems. And I think that helped to shape some of the subsequent discussions. At the end of this discussion, Sandy Kravitz said to me, well, uh, what do you want? And I was having 
uh, some infusion of classic academic jitters, uh, and said, well, I, I think the way to begin would be with $30,000 for a year's feasibility study, uh, which was the classic academic maneuver of what you did when you weren't sure what you were going to do or how you were going to do it. Uh, and thank heavens, uh, Sandy said, you can't have $30,000 for a feasibility study. And I said, why not? And he said, because you've got to take $300,000 and do it now. Everybody needs to hear something like that once in their life. Uh, and I went back to Boston, and I had not sat down and figured out uh, what a budget would be for this. And then a second thing happened, uh, which was that uh, when the minute we thought about it, we realized that if Tufts Medical School was going to undertake a project of this kind 1,500 miles away in Mississippi or Alabama or somewhere, uh, that there were two sets of predictable screams, one from the white Southern government, wherever it was, and the other from poor people in Boston saying, what are you doing 1,500 miles away when we're sitting on your doorstep? And we realized uh, that we had to add a second component. And so I sat down over uh, the next two or three weeks and wrote the first grant applic application for two community health centers. I hadn't been back to see Kravitz in, or anybody else at OEO in the meantime. Uh, and uh, the first uh, southern rural, uh, for reasons I'll tell you in a moment, and the second at the Columbia Point housing project, uh, housing project of eight or 9,000 people, four miles from downtown Boston, uh, with which T Count and Tufts Department of Preventive Medicine had had an ongoing relationship uh, of home visiting and care. Uh, an ideal in a number of respects, it had no doctors. Uh, it took hours and hours for people from there to get to any one of the major teaching hospitals, Boston City, Mass General Children's, in downtown Boston and wait to be seen and get back six hours, it turned out, when we did a formal study. Um, it was uh, on this isolated peninsula jutting out into Dorchester Harbor, and it was in the congressional district of John McCormick, the then Speaker of the House of Representatives. One of the things uh, that I brought to this and all of these kinds of efforts uh, was so useful was my prior career as a journalist. So I had learned then to pay attention to political phenomena of this kind, which wasn't part of most people's medical education. Uh, and uh, in the end of January, I reappeared at OEO. I had said 30,000, Sandy Kravitz had said 300,000. I appeared with a budget for 1.2 million. Uh, and they swallowed hard. Uh, the reason for calling it Southern Rural, which I had already figured out, uh, I really wanted to go to Mississippi. Obviously, it was what I had some experience of and what everybody perceived as the belly of the beast, the worst of the problems and the worst of uh, the racism and the worst of the need. Uh, uh, OEO grants had to be circulated uh, <coughs> through the relevant, wherever they were located, through the relevant congressional delegations. And uh, which would be a tip-off I mean, Southern, any relevant delegation, but certainly in the case of the South, because and the relevant political fact here was that the Southern governors were vehemently opposed to OEO <coughs> and correctly read the community action participation principle uh, as meaning here was a government agency for the first time that would be funding and involving uh, and possibly being led on the ground by uh, 
black people and black communities without going through all of their gatekeepers, whether black or white, in the traditional uh, political hand-me-down lineup. <laughs> and when the legislation was being argued in the Congress, had insisted on uh, the right of a, of a governor uh, to veto any uh, OEO project headed for their state. Uh, and of course, they would know about it if it circulated through the congressional delegation in advance. Uh, and Sergeant Shriver, or whoever would be the head of OEO, had the right, the power, in the legislation to override that veto. And that uh, did happen intermittently. But it was political capital that had to be expended really cautiously because OEO was on an annual uh, budget that had to be renewed in the Congress every year. And you spent too much political capital, and you would be out of business. Uh, and so I had listed it as Southern Rural. Uh, that meant 10 different states. You didn't have to go through all those congressional delegations. The site hadn't been picked yet. Uh, in the ensuing weeks, uh, two things happened. Uh, there was a go-ahead for Columbia Point. The uh, OEO and Sergeant Shriver had no problem with that, although uh, it was evident that Shriver had considerable reservations uh, about getting into the health arena. That was. Uh, his first difficulty. And I'm sure infighting in the government uh, from HEW, Health Education and Welfare then, and from the public health establishment in general, the state public health officers and all the rest, seeing this as an incursion on their turf, despite the fact that they didn't provide in the main clinical care. It was immunizations and uh, uh, infectious disease control, and the like, but not the treatment of sick people. That was a long division in medicine uh, that uh, is worth noting in the evolution of all of this. There had been the Milbank Funds uh, centers uh, in urban cities that distributed milk. There was in Boston a set of things called the George White Health Centers whose slogan, carved in stone on one of their buildings that I took a picture of, whose slogan was, uh, no diagnoses made, no prescriptions written, as a way to reassure the medical community that they weren't taking patients away from them in this division. OK, you can have public health, but don't steal our patients and our incomes. Uh, and uh, beyond concerns about getting into health, uh, of all things, uh, Shriver was leery about going to Mississippi. And uh, in a, knowing where we had all come from in terms of MCHR and the like, uh, he had a provision written into the grant uh, that said he reserved the right of formal approval of the site choice <laughs> in the South. Um, and that uh, became the struggle. So we went back to Boston and started organizing uh, Columbia Point as the first health center. Uh, the grant had finally been formally approved, except for the Southern Site Choice, on June 11th, 1965. Uh, we started work with the Boston Public Housing Authority uh, to renovate three apartments in one of the buildings uh, of uh, this public housing project into a health center. Uh, and uh, uh, meanwhile, and, and started that whole process. And there was a lot of attendant publicity in Boston because this was the first health center grant, uh, the first word of anybody uh, uh, anywhere about community health centers uh, and uh, these terms. Uh, 
And uh, John McCormick was on board. Uh, Julius Richmond was on board uh, for that part of it. We, meanwhile, were looking at data from about six states in the South. Uh, and uh, I think Count, out of history, had a little bit of a bias toward Georgia. And we actually went and made field visits at uh, a, f a four county area, four tiny counties, uh, near, near and around Sparta, Georgia. And they wanted you, didn't they? And they wanted us because they thought we were some kind of a Hilburton hospital that we would bring to them. Uh, let me back up in the process of organizing. Pause on, pause on. We're going. Okay. Uh, I mentioned <laughs> that we were working with the Boston Housing Authority. I got a call out of the blue from a man named John Hatch, who was the Deputy Director of Community Relations at the Boston Housing Authority, asking me if all the Southern positions were filled yet, as if we had filled one. We didn't even know where we were going yet. Uh, because the grant proposal had circulated through the Housing Authority, John saw it. John Hatch, in my book, the most brilliant community organizer uh, in the country, and certainly the most brilliant I have ever met or known or worked with, uh, uh, came out of uh, Alabama and Kentucky, uh, went to uh, Atlanta University. Oh, first, he went to law school. Uh, in Kentucky, in Lexington, I would guess it was, uh, after suing uh, because the law school admitted only whites, uh, they set up a separate law school for him, uh, which was a sham. Then uh, they yielded and said, okay, he could go to the regular law school, but he had to promise to sit by himself in the corner. And one of the stories John told me uh, was that on the first day, half the class came and sat next to him, half the white class, and he was moved by that. I suspect strongly that John had an early activist career uh, because he told me when he joined the Army uh, he went to Korea as um, uh, an environmental or uh, specialist of uh, technical specialist of some kind. Um, that his mother said, "Thank God you're going over there to the war because if you stay here, you're going to get killed." Uh, and uh, John. Uh, then decided the law school was a sham, left that, went to Atlanta University, got a degree in social work community organization, and came to Boston where he was an organizer first in the South End and then with the Public Housing Authority and then saw this grant uh, and called me up and came to see me and we hired him instantly and John was the first person in our group to go to Sparta, Georgia, where he had to uh, stand at the back door of the country club, which was the main restaurant in town, in order to get food. Uh, segregation was still in full bloom. Uh, and uh, uh, later on, when we decided it was worth exploring further, and they were very eager in the local medical community for whatever reason to have us, Count and I went down, accompanied by John, and we all had dinner at the country club. Um, you dangled a hospital, as they thought it was, in front of them, and they were willing to stretch uh, the bounds of uh, racial segregation. The other thing that had happened in the meantime that needs to be mentioned on behalf of both MCHR and a lot of other people was Selma. Uh, and uh, I 
in a reprise of what happened to me in Canada Lee's apartment in a way. I had flown to Selma. Uh, we knew uh, after, uh, before the massacre on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Uh, and the next day, we knew that uh, Dr. King was coming. MCHR's position was a physician had to be next to Dr. King at all times because uh, somebody was going to try and kill him. Uh, and I flew to, back to Atlanta and met him and flew on the plane with him to Montgomery. And then uh, they had sent a car for him. Uh, and he said, come ride with me. I had no other way to get back to Selma. And I didn't even have, like a lot of folks, uh, any secure uh, place to stay. Uh, so King said, well, come with me. You know, we'll find a place uh, wherever I'm going. And so I went to whatever was uh, uh, the activist headquarters. And I got to sit in the corner and listen that night to the long, heated, crucial discussion among King, Andy Young, Jim Foreman, I think Hosea Williams was there. I'm not sure about John Lewis for a reason I'll get to, but somebody from SNCC was there, uh, about what to do now. And there were all of these tensions and struggles playing out. Uh, uh, the activist group, especially uh, from SNCC, uh, but not limited to them, uh, that wanted to confront. There was already an injunction. Uh, don't march across the bridge. Don't march to Montgomery uh, uh, about what to do about that. And they wanted to violate it. And, they, and King wasn't certain, uh, but didn't, from the beginning, think that was a good idea. And there was further as an undertone, a good bit of SNCC in particular, and CORE to some extent, resentment of King at coming in at this stage and getting all the attention and publicity when they had done all of the grunt and soldier work and they were the people uh, who were uh, beaten up on the bridge and in Selma. And this went on for hours and I got to listen to it with a final tentative decision uh, uh, not to violate the injunction. Uh, King is meanwhile, I'm sure, talking on the phone to Lyndon Johnson, uh, but every day in front of the cameras, and there were now cameras, to march up to the police line and kneel and pray and be a presence and get filmed every day while the political struggle back in Washington uh, went on. Uh, and Selma was, all other things aside for me, and worth mentioning, I think for a lot of other people, a seminal experience. Uh, the filming of what happened on the bridge and everything that uh, the ABC television network did to get it on the air that Sunday night uh, struck such a national chord. I don't think there's any event quite like this, uh, what came to be 10,000 people uh, came from all over the country uh, to demonstrate at Selma. Uh, this kind of moral outpouring, stimulated further, I think, by the murder of uh, the Boston minister, James Reeve. And uh, in addition, a uh, couple of days later, uh, I got arrested by the Alabama police in Selma uh, and hauled off with another physician, MCHR physician, Dick Hausknecht, uh, to meet with uh, the leaders of the Alabama, uh, or the, uh, it was Alabama, uh, medical society, uh, who felt that the MCHR presence was a public statement that white doctors wouldn't take care of injured black people. Uh, and uh, 
and it threatened us uh, with further immediate and further jail if we so much as touched anybody medically. And I remember, on the one hand, it was frightening in the sense that it was quite clear they were prepared to throw us in jail cells with a couple of local whites who would beat us up. On the other hand, I pointed out to them that Alabama had a Good Samaritan law which said any doctor could take care of anybody in an emergency, uh, whether they were licensed or not. That was part of the oath and part of the law, and most states had it. And they didn't know I knew that or hadn't thought of it, and uh, it just ended. But apparently was, the arrest was the cause of a big rally in Boston over the fact that I had been arrested. Uh, more importantly than that, uh, that was when I first met John Lewis and realized that he had suffered yet another probable skull fracture. It was a real skull fracture on the Edmund Pettus Bridge that, uh, two days before. It wasn't a depressed skull fracture, thank God. And Count and I, Count had by this time uh, come to Selma, Count and I organized uh, to send him and Ivanhoe Donaldson to Boston to be hospitalized and examined and treated. Uh, uh, and I didn't see John Lewis again for another 30 years, I think. Uh, but we remembered each other, and he certainly remembered all of that. Uh, John Hatch called. Uh, and we are struggling with Shriver. He is continuing to waffle. We are looking in places in Mississippi where I really wanted to go. There was a limitation. The Congress, in its wisdom, had said OEO money couldn't be spent for bricks and mortar. And wisely, because they didn't want all this money to go for somebody to build buildings. They wanted it to go for services to needy communities. Uh, but it turned out that OEO was willing to be flexible about renovation. So I kept looking for some place I could renovate in Mississippi. And somebody told me there were some unfinished buildings in Mount Bayou, a place I had never heard of, uh, for what had been planned to be the J.C. Campbell Junior College uh, that had run out of money and were concrete shells just sitting there. That sounded good, and that was how I learned about Mount Bayou. And I went there, uh, flew down to Memphis, got a car, uh, and drove to Mount Bayou and discovered, I, first person I talked to was Father Guidry, the Catholic priest, who came out to see me as I was wandering around, uh, and discovered there was this hospital, that this was an all-black town. It had its own town government. Uh, people there could vote. They had some relative, if small, degree of autonomy. Uh, and maybe there was a place uh, that could be renovated, but this looked ideal from multiple points of view. We would have the shelter and protection of a black local government for what would uh, inevitably be an integrated crew uh, of doctors and nurses and whomever. Uh, and we would need to hospitalize people. And here was this small 40-bed black hospital run by a black fraternal order, the Knights and Daughters of Tabor, uh, building that, which started out like so many, selling burial insurance at two bucks a week or two bucks a month, uh, uh, and had somewhere in the early 1940s built this hospital, which was a real huge need because uh, blacks had no place to go except the state institutions, which of course were segregated and miser miserable, uh, or occasionally trailers run by some alcoholic local white doctor, or the basement of uh, some existing county hospital institution, and started selling, in effect, health insurance as well as burial insurance. And there it was. Uh, I knew nothing more about it at the point, but it certainly uh, looked good. The problem with the J.C. Campbell uh, 
uh, was twofold. They were concrete shelves. Uh, uh, the bishops, AME bishops attempt to build it had uh, run out of money. It turned out they were in receivership in some white law firm in Jackson that wanted millions for them and they weren't too suitable anyway. Uh, and uh, uh, so I started to try and figure out how we would get around that. And for the first time, proposed Mount Bayou uh, to the OEO, but kept all of that secret from Mississippi. Uh, I made, took care that no copy of that grant ever uh, went to Mississippi or circulated in Mississippi or there was any news about it. Uh, at that stage. Shriver still hadn't signed off and was stonewalling. And I finally, uh, uh, by this time, what, what time is it? This is now uh, early 1965. Mm -hmm. uh, on December 11th, no, early 1966, I'm sorry, late 1965. Well, we point out that in 1965, the Head Start program in Mississippi, Child Development Group of Mississippi, was the most successful in the nation, but it came under severe attack from Senator Stennis, and that OEO was leery of anything going into Mississippi to go up against that power structure. Right, and indeed, Senator Stennis and Mississippi had started their own rival Head Start organization, uh, and it was the subject of bitter controversy, and this will come up again. Uh, and so we had opened Columbia Point on December 11th, 1965, exactly one year uh, from the meeting in Greenville under the auspices, to the day under the auspices of uh, the Delta Ministry. The grant had been approved with the site approval reservation on June 11th, and six months later, John McCormick spoke, Julie Richmond spoke, I spoke, uh, national publicity, and community health centers were launched. Uh, during that ensuing 12 months, there were applications for community health centers uh, from Watts and UCLA in Los Angeles, uh, from Rush Medical School and the Miles Square community on the south side of Chicago, uh, from Denver, the University of Colorado and the Denver Health Department, and from Albert Einstein, Montefiore, uh, in the South Bronx. Uh, all under discussion are starting to be funded as research and demonstration projects because there was no authorization uh, for OEO to be doing this other than as a research and demonstration uh, rubric. So uh, this was all Sandy Kravitz and Julie Richmond. Meanwhile, uh, Shriver kept holding us up. And uh, so uh, one day I uh, uh, looked up the schedule and made sure that Shriver was scheduled to be testifying on the Hill, and that was going to take all afternoon. And Shriver had postponed meetings with me and uh, wouldn't give site approval or even discuss it uh, because of his anxiety about Mississippi. And uh, uh, I took the vice president, and he was also some kind of a dean, Trendenic his name was, I think. I took the vice president of Tufts uh, with me, and we flew down to Washington and staged a sit-in in Shriver's office walked right past his secretary and sat down. As somebody observed later, it was the first time in all of the 60s that the dean was sitting in, not the students. And uh, Shriver had to deal with us or he couldn't use his office and uh, we wouldn't budge. So he came back, he was told about this immediately, I'm sure, came back <coughs> and handed us over to Julie Richmond, uh, the deputy director of OEO and the head of Head Start. And I spent the rest of that afternoon uh, 
And I, I should add, Trendenic said, applied real pressure angrily saying, you, can, you have no business treating a major university this way, and we will tell every other university. And that was leverage. Um, so he handed us over to Julie Richmond, and I spent that afternoon talking to Julie Richmond and worked out an agreement. I don't remember that I had to give anything away uh, beyond the conventional assurances that we weren't a civil rights organization, we were a health organization. Remember, uh, this was not formally MCHR, this was Tufts. Uh, and OEO took comfort. All of the first five grants were to medical schools. It gave them cover, it assured quality, uh, and uh, they saw that as a way to proceed. At about Nine o'clock that evening, Julie said, okay, I will, I had sketched out the agreement. We had uh, worked it out together on a yellow pad. And he said, in the morning, I'll give it to the secretaries and they can type it up and we'll bring it to Shriver. And I thought to myself, no way. And I said, Julie, it's okay. I type a hundred words a minute. Uh, you find me a typewriter and I'll just sit down and do it now. And his jaw dropped, uh, but there it was. And I sat down and I typed it out and he took it up to Shriver, who was still in his office. And he must, in addition, have said, I recommend we do this uh, because he was critical uh, uh, to accomplish that step. And Shriver signed it and sent it back down with a little note congratulating me for my tenacity, accompanied by a little gift of fruit, which I later realized was raspberries. But <laughs> I don't know if he was sending a political message or not. And at that point, uh, we were free and clear for Mississippi. And what I did uh, was uh, two things with Mount Bayou firmly in mind and uh, having convinced OEO that, yeah, renovation would include uh, uh, an assembly of prefab units, that 60 by 20 foot modules, the firm that had uh, been contracted to build a health center in Watts by this time could come down to Mississippi and build us a health center and that would still be renovation and furthermore it would be a lease purchase and that uh, would be okay. We wouldn't be constricted by uh, uh, the condition of no, no bricks and mortar. No bricks uh, or mortar either. That's right, literally. Uh, and I had figured this out and convinced OEO. Uh, I then started conspicuously wandering around Batesville in the north of the Delta a, quite a big town, I had lots of doctors, looking for a place to renovate. And my presence was noted, although they weren't sure there what I was about. Then I gave a copy of the grant to Joe Disparty. Uh, we were, Milestone had closed, but we were already starting community organization in Mount Bayou, in Bolivar County. Uh, and I realized by this time, to recapitulate something earlier, that what we had done, what I had done unconsciously was recapitulate Palela and Lamontville. Here we were in a 500 square mile rural area, it turned out to be of the Delta in Mississippi, and a public housing, like Palela, and a public housing project in Boston, like Lamontville, but that wasn't conscious. Uh, I gave the grant to Joe Disparty. She gave it to a doctor she knew in Batesville and it was on the governor's desk the next day. This was deliberate. Um, this was the, the, the grant to go to Batesville? The, no, the grant just said Southern Rural. Oh, okay. And so they assumed it was gonna be Batesville, but in any case, the grant was on the governor's desk a day later. And the governor screamed at Shriver and OEO, and Stennis screamed at Shriver and OEO. There is a wonderful set of conversations of which I have the summaries, uh, 
uh, between Nils Wessel, the president of Tufts, and Governor Johnson uh, of, Mississippi. of Mississippi. And uh, there was a lot of newspaper publicity, the Jackson, Clarion, Ledger, and elsewhere. Uh, and uh, a roar from uh, the State Medical Society uh, and from Archie Gray, uh, the uh, State Health Commissioner, uh, whose political hero was uh, Senator Bilbo, uh, he told me, and whose behaviors uh, fit that mold. I think I didn't mention uh, that uh, in addition to this veto provision, the southern governors had agreed, they thought, well, maybe we can tap into this money. So they agreed that grants to institutions of higher education wouldn't be subject, couldn't be subject to veto. So maybe Ole Miss and the University of Alabama could tap into some of this. But there was nothing in the law I had sat down and realized that said you couldn't give a grant to an institution of higher education in Massachusetts to do something in Mississippi. Uh, we were accused with some uh, correctness of having reinvented carpetbagging. But what happened was the Governor, John Governor Johnson, and Senator Sennis, and everybody else suddenly discovered that we were veto-proof. The only guy who could veto our grant was the governor of Massachusetts, and he didn't care and wasn't about to and they couldn't stop it, although they were screaming uh, that it should be stopped, and all of the foreign agitator interloper, plus their official position that they were taking care of all of this and there was no need that they weren't meeting, despite the data which were appalling on black infant mortality rates and the like. Um, Pause for just one second. Okay, we're back. Okay. Uh, so then there was an annual clinical meeting of the American Medical Association in Atlantic City uh, uh, that uh, spring of late 65 or early 1966. Uh, I would have to look it up to be precise. And Count and I, and I wanted Count with his southern accent uh, for sure to be there, arranged to meet with the leaders uh, of the Mississippi State Medical Society, who would all be at the AMA meeting, and discuss all of this. And so we went, and we were received in their uh, hotel suite, and it was all very courtly and polite and gentlemanly, and they served us coffee, and we sat down to talk. And uh, we spent a lot of time uh, talking they, on their part about how this wasn't needed and we really didn't need to intervene and they were taking care of it. And my talking about what the data showed and saying, in fact, that this would relieve them of a burden because if they really attempted to undertake care of the poor, the lines would be two miles long. And we understood how the system worked and we were back and forth on that. And then uh, they spent a lot of time uh, talking to us about how this certainly wasn't needed in Batesville and there were all of these doctors and they were going to do this and that. And I don't think there was explicit discussion of being veto-proof, but it was understood. And after we had spent about an hour and a half, I said, well, the only other place I had even given any thought to was Mount Bayou. And it was like pulling the lever on a slot machine and watching three oranges come up in their eyes. And they said, well, we still don't think you should do this, uh, but if you absolutely have to, probably the only place you could do it is Mount Bayou. And, and, and all this all black town and uh, black community, and there weren't any white doctors, and uh, uh, in effect, I expressed great reluctance, but I allowed them to force me to go to where I really wanted to go in the first place. And uh, uh, that worked as far as 
these leaders of the State Medical Association, but it didn't mean that all opposition uh, was about to end. Now, buttressing Mount Bayou, I should uh, interject, John Hatch had gone down to Bolivar County to do the same kind of scouting job uh, that we had done in Georgia uh, of what was on the ground and what was there and what the needs were and what the potential resources were. And this was in September. It must have been September of 65. Uh, and uh, disappeared for three weeks. We didn't hear from him. Uh, we didn't know where he was. Mississippi was dangerous. Uh, we grew very anxious. And then he came back to Boston and reappeared at Tufts. He already had an appointment as assistant professor of preventive medicine on the faculty. And I said, John, where were you? What were you doing? He said, well, I picked cotton for three weeks. And then I understood fully the first time uh, oh, what a treasure we had. He had lived in sharecropper shacks. He had been all over Bolivar County. He knew who the leaders were. He knew what the needs were. He knew what uh, uh, the white circumstances were. It should be made clear that uh, we were looking at a period of profound destitution in the Delta because the sharecropper system had collapsed with the introduction of mechanized agriculture and one double row cotton picking machine replaced a hundred sharecroppers and so they no longer needed their labor and with that among other things it wasn't just unemployment and no money uh, but no health care bad as it was since plantation owners no longer had a vested interest in the health of this workforce and people squatting at best in old sharecropper cabins and John uh, scouted and knew and understood all of this. Uh, I spent some months then uh, dealing not only with Archie Gray but with the State Medical Society, uh, the Delta Medical Society, and the Bolivar County Medical Society, all of which had meetings. I got invited to speak critically at the annual meeting of the Delta Medical Society held at the country club in Greenwood. Uh, uh, and gave my talk. I learned something important there. Uh, gained my, gave my talk about um, uh, what the needs were, who we were, uh, what needed to be done, and what we planned to do. Uh, very straightforward and not judgmental and not accusing, but speaking as a doctor. Uh, which was my stance throughout as the way to go. Uh, and they then, as I expected, took a vote, and the vote was 50 to 1 to disapprove. There was one black doctor that must have just been admitted to the Delta Medical Society, uh, the White Medical Society, Aaron somebody, and he uh, voted for it, and 50 abstentions. And if I didn't understand immediately, I understood shortly thereafter. They invited me to come that evening to the country club dinner and dance, being courtly Southerners, and I said, sure. And I went to the dinner, and I danced with the wife of the president of the Delta Medical Society, and then I had to go to the men's room, and I did, and 30 doctors came in after me. And I thought, oh my God, uh, it's going to be like jail. And they came up to me quietly and they said, that's a good thing you're trying to do. You go ahead and do it. And it was my first lesson that there were people of goodwill in the white community and even the white professional community who would respond to this.
as long as they were never exposed publicly as doing so. Uh, and that was my first lesson in that. And so uh, I, uh, this was while Shriver was still stonewalling. And I got on the plane and flew to Washington the next morning because I knew he would, I was quite sure he was sending his spy around after me uh, to keep tabs on what was happening and what I was doing. And he would totally misunderstand the 50 to 1 vote and not know about the abstentions and what they meant. Uh, and uh, flew to Washington to uh, report that and explain it. And indeed, in my digging around decades later, uh, I don't know how I found it, but I came across the report of his spy uh, to Shriver. There was one, and he had gone out. He hadn't been there at the meeting, but he'd gone out afterwards and interviewed everybody in various groups that I had talked to, uh, all of whom told him lies that I had said things like, we're coming whether you like it or not, and we're going to shove it down your throats, or whatever their fantasies that they thought would be useful were. The last meeting was with the Bolivar County Medical Society. It was supposed to be at the Holiday Inn in Greenville. Uh, and it got moved to the county courthouse. We had the meeting there, and I discovered that they had placed me in the, printer, the prisoner's dock. Uh, but we had the meeting, and it was a repetition of the same thing. And we began uh, in Mount Bayou, which was a question, first of all, of contracting to get the health center built. Uh, secondly, uh, starting to recruit and recruiting people, even with the promise of faculty appointments at Tufts, which was important, doctors and nurses and others uh, to come to a small village of 2,000 or less people uh, in the Mississippi Delta in 1966. Uh, was not going to be easy. There were questions of resources in terms of where we were going to live. And here was this black hospital, the Taborian, the Knights and Daughters of Tabor, the Fraternal Order. And it turned out a second, smaller hospital of 20 beds, the Sarah Brown, by a different Fraternal Order, the United Order of Friendship, that had split off after some schism and that both of them, despite having really abysmal quality troubles, uh, underfunded, uh, isolated, undertrained, no different than many small isolated rural hospitals, but intensified uh, by being black and isolated on those grounds and underfunded uh, because of that suffering uh, from the sharecropper collapse uh, in terms of revenue, that both of them were on the brink of bankruptcy uh, and weren't even going to be able to meet payroll. Uh, and Tufts was really remarkable, I think, uh, during those years. Tufts and OEO, I got uh, uh, permission somehow uh, to use our grant to rent the Taborian Hospital Nurses Residence, uh, which was the old mansion in Mount Bayou, the only three-story brick building in town uh, that had been once occupied by Dr. Howard, the flamboyant, uh, I forget his initials, uh, PRM uh, Howard, PRM Howard uh, who had uh, lived there and, in fact, it started the United Order of Friendship. It was nominally their nursing resident. I think I rented it for $25,000 out of Tufts money so they could meet their payroll uh, at the two hospitals. The upshot was that uh, I uh, sat down uh, with George Allen, a consultant brought in by OEO, and wrote a grant to OEO to merge those two hospitals. One of them would become a dental clinic that Taborian would continue as the 40-bed hospital. Uh, 
but no longer under the control of fraternal orders, uh, but as a community hospital open to all of the poor of Bolivar County and perhaps, perhaps elsewhere. And there was uh, a long struggle uh, to bring that about. John Frankel, at this point, was uh, the head of the Office of Health Affairs. Uh, and um, uh, at one point, I was told, we think John Frankel actually owned the hospital for a week before we could uh, create the new entity. Uh, in this respect, it turned out uh, that uh, OEO made some significant mistakes and in, it never became a bona fide or real community hospital. They were supposed to have all kinds of community meetings uh, for valid elections and participation. And it ended up uh, not only under the, the, with a board under representing entirely the two fraternal orders, uh, but with the fraternal orders permitted to continue their business of selling health insurance uh, as well as admitting poor people free of charge. And there was an inherent conflict of interest outside of anything else because we're talking about the same people, in effect, as patients. And there were uh, enormous uh, quality of care problems, understandably, as well. But we proceeded. Talk, talk some about the organization and operation. Uh, yeah. Uh, we, John Hatch, was community organizing in a way that almost never happened in OEO uh, health center projects. Uh, uh, in those years, uh, the resolution wasn't community control, it was community participation in the creation of community advisory councils or advisory committees or boards. John patiently, slowly organized 10 local health associations in Northern Bolivar County. We had specified Northern Bolivar, 500 square miles, 10 towns and their rural areas as all we would really be able reasonably to manage. That was 14,000, somewhere between 12 and 14,000 black people. We had taken our own full-scale uh, census and done our own uh, representative health survey. So we knew something of the magnitude of the problems we faced and what lay ahead of us. Uh, and started recruiting. Uh, through Tufts, while John spent all of this time uh, building these health organizations using as an organizational model, but not any specific affiliation, the Black Baptist Church. That's the organizational form that people were familiar with, understood, had experience running, and could organize a local health association uh, around. Uh, and People recruited themselves in addition. We rapidly got from somewhere, uh, there appeared this remarkable uh, Catholic nurse midwife, Sister Mary Stella, uh, uh, another nurse midwife from Denmark uh, that had been working for the WHO, Ilse Johansson, Joe Desparty and Phyllis Cunningham, and a group of other nurses, both from MCHR backgrounds and elsewhere, a fair component of uh, black nurses. Uh, Chris Hansen, Christian Hansen, who had been uh, active in the movement, uh, lived in Bob Smith's house for a while, uh, recruited himself to come and join. And I ran ads as, as a physician. As a physician. Uh, I uh, did everything I could, uh, not only to run advertisements, but to uh, uh, obtain publicity uh, for this effort. Uh, 
I went to the sheriff of Bolivar County and said, we are going to be this integrated crew and we are going to be fanning out in North Bolivar County and we are going to be, you know, whites and blacks and we are going to be trying to do this good thing of taking care of sick people who have no other good source of health care. And it would be really bad for Bolivar County and Mississippi if anything bad happened to us uh, because I know, I used to be a journalist, and I know people on every newspaper in the United States, and if anything happened to any of us, it would be in headlines tomorrow in any newspaper in the United States, and it would be just like what happened in Selma. And he said, I am sure you're not going to have any difficulty. Uh, it was another instance where a different background helped. And indeed, uh, there started to be, once we really got going, articles about us in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Time Magazine, Newsweek, uh, the Associated Press, uh, uh, all sorts of sources from former colleagues uh, from those earlier years. And they were, what was important about that was attracting recruits, uh, uh, and giving us uh, a shield uh, uh, against, I think, any kind of opposition that would be too overt. Uh, in the beginning, uh, we were waiting for a clinical facility to be built, but we were doing community organization, the surveys, home health visiting, public health visiting, uh, uh, prenatal care with the midwives and staff training. We took advantage of lots of other OEO programs and sent people off to learn how to, local black people from Bolivar County mostly, sent people off to learn how to be typists, secretaries, medical librarians, uh, uh, some degree of technicians, community health workers. John built a staff which was the biggest uh, part of the health center in those years, uh, the division called Community Health Action, which was uh, the community organization uh, staffing. John, early on, recognized the need for environmental intervention. All these people drinking water from the drainage ditch and uh, living in collapsed housing and uh, with uh, filthy outhouses and the like. Uh, and uh, recruited a black sanitarian, sanitary engineer, Andrew James, from Ohio, who came to head what became a major environmental program of digging wells, starting with slim, but later with machines, and digging privies, sanitary privies, teaching people how to do it, and educating people to what a health center was um, but we still weren't doing clinical care because the health center hadn't been built. And uh, we realized that we had to begin that. And so we rented um, a vacant church parsonage in Mount Bayou and used uh, the living room as a waiting room, two bedrooms as examining rooms, and the kitchen as a lab, and just started. Uh, I had recruited mostly pediatricians, Chris Hansen, Leon Kruger from a fancy suburb of Newton, uh, Roy Brown uh, from somewhere else, Mo because the population skew uh, was uh, so much, in a way, similar to Palella, uh, uh, the young and the old. And, uh, children in particular, uh, the median age in the population was 15. The median age of heads, male heads of household uh, was 50. The whole generation in between was in Chicago looking for jobs uh, or St. Louis uh, or uh, wherever. And so we said, we're going to begin clinical care. And the first day, uh, there were maybe 15 people. They sent scouts, which people always do. 
and the next day there were 25, and the third day there were 100. Uh, also, it was not uncommon for me to get up in the morning. All the plans for housing development had fallen through, and we had, most of us, uh, rented trailers. I mean, Chris Hansen and many others were talking about guys with families and children, uh, rented these big wide-body trailers uh, to put on lots in Mount Bayou and uh, live in. Uh, and, uh, but we were overwhelmed. Uh, and Aaron Shirley, now in Jackson, and Bob Smith, these two black doctors that had been so active in the movement, had their own active practices in Jackson and somehow, nonetheless, came up two days a week uh, to help us out clinically because we just didn't have enough staff. And furthermore, we had all these pediatricians taking care of adult people with hypertension and diabetes and struggling. Uh, and meanwhile, slowly, the health center itself uh, was being built. And we grew and grew over uh, the ensuing years. A second thing uh, that uh, had happened that should be mentioned is in the summer of 66, when Columbia Point uh, was open and uh, thriving in its early stages, uh, Senator Ted Kennedy came to visit it. This was the beginning of his primary interest in health and health care as his issue uh, got uh, very taken by what he saw. Uh, that was August of 66. We had dinner that night to discuss what to do. He went back to Washington and wrote legislation specifically creating an Office of Health Affairs within OEO uh, with an initial budget of $50 million uh, explicitly to build health centers. That was the first time. No more research and demonstration, but a major launch program uh, with all of the attendant publicity and community health centers started in a major way, not just because there was funding, but because so many Congress people suddenly realized that it would really be a nice thing to bring home a community health center to their district, although a majority of them were community sponsored. Uh, we got the building put together. Uh, we. Uh, assembled this growing staff. Recruitment was a continuing problem. We never could hire a black epidemiologist. Uh, you couldn't get people, professional people, easily to come to Mississippi and to live in this simple village. Uh, and there were all of the questions that hampered many other places, which were, where are you going to send your kids to school? what quality were the schools, and we understood that people were going to leave when uh, their uh, kids got older uh, and were in full-scale operation by 1967. 1967 early was when we did the church parsonage, and later that year was when uh, the health center finally got put together. The, one of the things that uh, you talked about. That, right. <laughs> you uh, one of the that. things. That was the <laughs> first part of that sentence. Okay. And so we were doing uh, clinical care, that is, doctors seeing patients, many of whom had never seen a physician before in their life, or if they had, had never been examined because the white practice was that the patient came out of the segregated waiting room sat across the desk, the doctor looked at them, maybe listened to them, didn't examine them, and uh, uh, wrote a prescription. Uh, and we were different. Uh, we had part-time uh, Aaron and uh, Bob Smith, Aaron Shirley and Bob Smith. Uh, we scored several other coups uh, 
uh, the recruitment of Harvey Sanders, a black, multiply qualified uh, surgeon from Hollandale, Mississippi, uh, a physician, Charles Humphrey from Fayette, uh, and Helen Barnes, uh, a native Mississippian uh, who had practiced in Greenwood after uh, graduating medical school and then gone to Brooklyn and uh, trained, and got her board certification in OBGYN and uh, came back and looked at us when we were still building a health center. I had chased her for two years and uh, she said, there's just a hole in the ground. As soon as you got the health center built, call me again and I'll come. This is a lady, you've got to imagine Pearl Bailey with an MD uh, uh, who was uh, vitally important. Uh, and so we slowly grew. And then I recruited David Weeks, who had been running medical care for Aramco in Saudi Arabia and decided his kids were old enough to come uh, to the U.S. And I somehow convinced him that the cutting edge of what was going on in the United States was in Mount Bayou, Mississippi, and he became our clinical director. Uh, so he had this triumvirate uh, of John Hatch, Andy James Environmental, uh, Dave Weeks, Clinical, uh, Helen Barnes, and others. The 10 health associations uh, each sent delegates to an organization called the North Bolivar County Health Council, which was our official advisory group. The other thing that had happened that's worth noting is that we had uh, uh, tried to charter the health center as a not-for-profit organization in Mississippi, which it was, and the law at that time was that the governor had to sign all not-for-profit charters, and of course he wouldn't. So we had to organize as a charitable trust while we fought it in the courts and won. Uh, but in the meantime, it was a charitable trust, which meant that the trustees of Tufts University had no corporate protection. Uh, and six or seven of them put all of their assets in their wives' names and became the trustees of the charitable trust that was the health center. Uh, one of many I think remarkable things that institution did. Uh, the next thing John Hatch did, uh, I had told him all about Palella. He was uh, a, an enthusiastic gardener himself in any case. Uh, and we thought maybe we could get people uh, to start some vegetable gardens, because there was vacant land around some of these shacks and uh, stuff that could be uh, maybe used. And we thought maybe we'd get 100 families uh, to do vegetable gardens. And a 1,000 families raised their hands. Uh, and we realized that we were looking at people with agricultural skills, now unemployed as sharecroppers, sitting on the richest land in the U.S., the topsoil 12 feet deep, which was totally devoted either to cotton or soybeans or under acreage restriction to nothing. And there were around Mount Bayou a modest number of black farmers uh, that owned some land. And they, John uh, and his crew, organized the North Bolivar County Farm Cooperative. Uh, as part of the Southern Federation of Cooperative Organizations. Uh, starting out with about 20 acres uh, from one and 10 acres from another of the local black farmers that were sitting idle that they donated to us. Nobody had tried truck gardening in the Delta before. Uh, with this remarkable woman, L.C. Dorsey, uh, as the deputy director of the farm co-op, Elsie uh, had been a leading activist uh, 
uh, had left school in the ninth grade to work with Fannie Lou Hamer, married as a sheriff, married at 16, I think, continued the activism, married a sharecropper, had six kids, joined us uh, as uh, a trainer of nurse aides uh, uh, early on, did her GED at the health center, one of the programs we had. We had an office of education and hired uh, the retired uh, principal of the Mount Bayou High School as its director and we're making arrangements through our own connections uh, to send uh, young people uh, uh, to schools and colleges uh, around the country, prep schools in some cases, and universities and professional schools in others, uh, because there were people around, not only with high school degrees, but people with college and professional degrees here and there, mostly working as teachers uh, in the usual uh, traditional roles. And in that first segment, uh, we sent uh, seven people to nursing to medical school, two to Tufts, the first two, uh, uh, both of whom, after they got their degrees in training, came back to work at the health center. Uh, nursing school, social work school, pharmacy school, uh, uh, playing college, uh, uh, two people getting master's degrees in clinical psychology at the University of Washington in Seattle, uh, and two courses uh, that John Hatch and Andy James organized, or three. Uh, Andy brought in people from all around the country and trained the first 10 registered black sanitarians in Mississippi history, all of whom, after Andy's course, local people, went down to Jackson and took the exam and passed. Uh, a second uh, course that we called uh, a college prep or professional, pre preparatory professional uh, that senior staff taught, uh, uh, a number of whom ended up uh, going to college or professional school, particularly at Stony Brook a little later on, and uh, the farm co-op. We went up and got a big grant from the Ford Foundation, uh, and John and Elsie organized what became a 500-acre uh, irrigated triple crop, mechanized, uh, partly mechanized uh, farm uh, involving somewhere between four and 6,000 persons from Bolivar County uh, who uh, planted the vegetables, raising vegetables instead of cotton or soybeans. And the way it worked is they uh, were full members of the co-op. There were co-op boards parallel to the local health associations, but different. Uh, and they traded their labor, uh, both for some immediate income and then shares in the crop. Uh, and grew over the next several years, literally thousands, I think tens of thousands, once we got to 500 acres, of tons of uh, vegetables, uh, okra, beets, sweet potatoes, yams, high-protein corn, uh, potatoes, uh, greens of all kinds, cukes, you name it, uh, we grew it. And indeed for a while ran a meat locker uh, and uh, uh, started uh, to sell surplus uh, in the open local market. And even had dreams for a while of getting a cannery and growing soul food 
that could be canned and sold in the northern ghettos. Uh, we had the backing of uh, the people in Minnesota that owned the Jolly Green Giant. And John and I, John Hatch and I went up and talked to them and said what we would like to do and could we call it the Jolly Black Giant and they thought that was a wonderful idea. And the government had a cannery 30 miles away that had been in white hands uh, and gone bust and e economic development agency and wouldn't give it to us. It became clear the government was interested in palliative programs for black communities, but not in capital programs and entrepreneurship and uh, real things uh, that uh, they would uh, run and operate. One of the problems that uh, we faced in rural Bolivar County was that people uh, didn't have cars, they didn't have access uh, to the center. How, how did you do outreach there? Uh, the Health Council, we kept shifting as many programs, ancillary programs, as we could to the Health Council, which uh, got independently funded uh, uh, by OEO. Uh, that became uh, a practice. And so they ran we had a parallel organization that was separate in the farm co-op and the farm co-op board uh, and its staff. Uh, the health council also ran uh, an emergency food program. That was really a WIC program for mothers and infants. Uh, and uh, a library and bookstore as a cultural center and a uh, some of the, and an early childhood intervention program in the 10 satellite communities where we had uh, places uh, uh, where uh, initially people could uh, become in each of these places the, to be then transported to and from the health center because we are again talking 500 square miles and a lot of towns. Uh, and so the Health Council, together with us but under their control, organized the bus transportation network that operated through all of the 10 towns of Bolivar County to and from the health center, but around, and it became not only, and we had ambulances and other vehicles for staff, uh, and particularly the visiting nurses, uh, but also became, uh, to some extent, extended opportunities for economic mobility. You had a way of getting from the rural area to the town where there might be a job, uh, or to another town where there might be a job. So the Health Council had its own set of uh, activities uh, and also, uh, uh, we had uh, used our leverage, and, and they did, they started inventing programs of their own. Uh, in Round Lake, uh, a small town uh, north of us, uh, a remarkable woman, uh, Mrs. Robinson, uh, recognized a need that we hadn't fully seen or understood that there were all of these isolated elderly folks living alone uh, whose kids and grandkids had gone to St. Louis or Chicago and were often in desperate circumstances, hungry, isolated, uh, uh, and needed help. So the first thing she did was organize uh, a meal program uh, and then an entire social network program where they all got together three or four times a week and got, not only got their meal, but had a range of activities with each other all day so they were not isolated. Despite it was extended family support didn't work that well because so many people, as in South Africa, were gone somewhere else uh, looking for work. Uh, so they were participant in everything. Uh, 
Uh, it's worth mentioning an episode, I think, unique in OEO's history uh, and a part of this story. So we're doing clinical care, midwifery, health education, professional training, growing food, uh, repairing houses, plantation shacks uh, with screens, uh, a variety of ways of going after food, including uh, the food co-op, uh, the farm co-op in particular. Intervening, in effect, in all of what are now called the social determinants of health, the things that were making people sick in the first place because uh, these environmental circumstances uh, uh, were such uh, a major factor in what was making people sick in the first place. We really tired over and over again of seeing uh, infants with infectious diarrhea and dehydration, moribund, from drinking water in the drainage ditch. And if we were lucky finding a vein to stick a needle in to rehydrate them, put them in the hospital, and what? Then send them back to drink some more water from the drainage ditch? Uh, it was ineffective economically, but much more important in human terms. Uh, uh, needed this other uh, kind of intervention. And now, almost 50 years later, people are finally starting to focus once again on social determinants of health and the fact that uh, uh, it is not just medical care alone that Dr. needs to be changed. Dr. Geiger, you have given us, I think, a <laughs> wonderful summary in the last two minutes of exactly what the Tufts Delta Health Center did uh, we have taken too much of your time. This has been fascinating. Uh, but I'm wondering if you would uh, tell us uh, uh, something about the situation in which uh, you <coughs> left uh, Mount Bayou and uh, your career uh, since that time. OK. Uh, two things should be noted out of all of this, and they involve hundreds of thousands uh, professional people by now, so uh, it is hardly uh, just myself and my colleagues. There are now more than 1,200 community health centers in the United States, in every state and territory. With their satellites, they are providing care at uh, a little more than 8,000 different sites. If you put all of that on a map, it looks like a map of the United States with measles. There are so many of these places. Uh, they, have, they take care of a little more than 20 million people, low income, uh, whites and blacks, mostly minority and Hispanics and Native American people, uh, urban and rural, and in the migrant streams, and in public housing projects, and in schools public schools. Uh, and that is what has grown uh, with the input of uh, thousands of other health professionals and thousands of other communities. As they have evolved now under uh, uh, the rubric of uh, health education and welfare, now health and human services, and the Bureau of Primary Care, uh, uh, they have, since 1975, uh, become unique in the American healthcare system in the following respect that stems from all of this early work. Every community health center, federally qualified community health center, uh, uh, has to be, by law, a non-for-profit organization uh, with an elected board, 51% of whose members must be current patients of the health center. There is no other part of the American healthcare system where patients have this kind of voice in the policies and direction of their own medical care. So that needs to be mentioned as really the most important thing that has gone on uh, since those days. Uh, in personal terms, uh, in 1971, I think, or thereabouts, uh, I switched from Tufts Medical School to the new, uh, then new medical school at the State University of New York at Stony Brook on 
Long Island. Uh, and it's part of a process in which the Health Council, uh, understanding that it could stay with Tufts, they weren't like some piece of suitcase that I carried around, they could stay with Tufts, they could come to Stony Brook, they wanted to look at Wisconsin and Meharry. They made what I believe is the only set of reverse site visits by a community group going to these places and saying, well, uh, if this project comes to you, what will you offer our community? In the way of scholarships, for example. And they ultimately chose Stony Brook and something like 19 people uh, that I can count from Bolivar County in our area uh, went to the State University of New York on Stony Brook on scholarship and got their degrees. And that was more even than we had done at any single institution before them. Uh, I had a difficult time at Stony Brook. I'm a city boy. I am fine in the boondocks of Mississippi or other rural areas or uh, South Africa. Uh, Sydney and Emily Kark, by the way, and their colleagues came and, and John Castle came and visited uh, both Columbia Point and uh, the Delta Health Center in Mount Bayou. We have come full circle. John Hatch, I should add, uh, in case he's not on your list to interview, uh, uh, was left to uh, do a doctorate in public health at the University of North Carolina School of Public Health. Uh, the minute he got his doctorate, they hired him as a member of their faculty. He went on to become the Ward Keenan Professor of Public Health, the first African American to hold an endowed chair. Uh, in the health professions at that university. And uh, through the, the uh, Christian Medical Council and a whole variety of foundations and other organizations to which he was consultant, uh, became really an international force uh, for community health organization, healthcare delivery, and change. Uh, uh, I left Stony Brook because there was going to be, there was just forming a new medical school in New York City called the City University of New York Medical School that was going to be explicitly uh, devoted to training people for primary care in underserved urban areas of New York uh, with a particular focus on the recruitment, admission and recruitment of uh, minority and low-income students. To overcome uh, some of the traditional barriers, uh, we admitted students upon their graduation from high school and combined college and the first years of medical school at low tuition. Uh, they would go on to uh, regular schools for the clinical years to get their MD under an agreement in which they would pay back with at least uh, two or more years of service as primary care physicians in underserved, mostly urban areas of the city and state. In effect, the opportunity uh, to train people to do what I and all the other community health center people had done. And indeed, our clinical campus became, which I helped to organize, became eight community health centers in New York City. And that's where our students had their first clinical experience. Uh, so I founded the Department of Community Health and Social Medicine at the City University of New York Medical School, now called the Sophie Davis School of Biomedical Education. And I was there from 1978 until I nominally retired in, I think, 1996 or some such year. Uh, and although I continued to teach every year, keep an office there uh, and be active, have since uh, been very, very much involved uh, with uh, 
both medical education organizations, uh, public health organizations, national medical fellowships, which is uh, the major NGO that supports uh, medical education and other education, uh, health-related education of uh, minorities. Um, now with a uh, new organization called Medical Legal Partnerships that puts lawyers in every community health center and hospital it can to start addressing the legal problems that are making poor patients sick in the first place. Lousy housing, mold in the walls, exploitative landlords, exploitative job bosses, uh, uh, and other legal difficulties, which has the wonderful effect of sensitizing the medical staff uh, uh, to find out about these social environmental problems that are contributing so much uh, to the illness of uh, these populations. Uh, so I am still rattling around uh, trying to disturb the peace and uh, uh, keep some of these efforts going uh, through other organizations. Uh, at 87, which is what I am now, um, I don't quite have the stamina uh, for doing some of the things that went on in the 60s and 70s and 80s, but there are other roles, and one of the most important ones uh, I just, for example, have been supervising uh, a more than $4 million grant to National Medical Fellowships that puts minority students on elective clerkships in community health centers. Uh, the most important task at this point is to do what I can to see that there becomes a next generation of people in the professions and outside the professions that has this orientation and does this work. I would just like to conclude by pointing out that the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences honored Dr. Jack Geiger, quote, for creating a model of a contemporary community health center to serve the poor and disadvantaged and for contributions to the advancement of minority health. That is an understatement, if anything. Thank you very much, Dr. Geiger, for sharing your life with us. Well, my pleasure, folks. Could I ask you a medical, social medical? This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture.